Okay. All right. I think we're good. Oh, cool. Hey, thanks for doing this, by the way, because I couldn't find anyone to do it. No problem. Thanks for <laughs> doing it as well. Although I guess I think apparently, I think the guy said you did a lot of debates on call outs. So. Yeah. Well, I mean, yeah, I guess they're new. So yeah, I've never had such a problem getting on there though. Like, uh, Oh, sure. I debated a, a Gary Johnson supporter without any glitches. Well, no, there was a glitch in the middle. We had like an eight-minute pause, but they edited it out. So yeah, <laughs> I guess it was all right. So I, I was on to clarify our positions. Are you a Hillary supporter or just you hate her less than you hate Trump? Yeah, I hate her less than I hate Trump pretty much. I'm the same, like, but reverse. I don't really like either one. I just hate her more than I hate him. Okay. So I, I, I he, really don't he says lots of stupid things. Yeah. And so does she. And so for me, it's just an ethics thing. Gotcha. Yeah. Um, I guess, do you want to roll through positions or do you want to bring up a point and I'll bring up a counterpoint? How do you want to do it? Whatever. I mean, I can tell you my main reasons why I don't like her. You can say why you hate him more if you want. <laughs> like basically everything. Um, not everything, but most of the things that are really bad about him that a president can actually do, mm -hmm. which are outside of their personality, foreign policy, domestic policy, thing, economics, things like that. Some of the things he's bad on, she's worse. So, okay. But for me, the, the president's mostly in charge of foreign policy, and Hillary Clinton's been a disaster. For, she's supported – I'm very anti-war, and that's a, it's an ethical thing for me. Hillary's been responsible for the deaths of hundreds of thousands of people. And she supported every war from Kosovo to Syria. And Trump's bad on some of those. Uh, at least he's backed off on the Iraq war now, and he has a better foreign policy in Syria, which is a current conflict. So that's very important to me. So I guess speaking then exactly to the anti-war thing, I'm very anti-war too. And of all the positions that I think that Hillary has that are the least tenable, I would say that her foreign policy is probably the worst. Um, in terms of... Being a warmonger, though, I feel like Trump has made so many outlandish comments in regards to how he would conduct himself via foreign policy that, it, I don't know, it's kind of a hard buy for me that Trump would be better in terms of foreign policy than Hillary when it comes to doing the war things. I guess for my specific examples, um, all of the strange comments he's made about nuclear weapons, there was the thing about whether or not we can nuke everybody, although that was a hearsay thing, so maybe he did, maybe he didn't actually say that. Um, there was the idea that a bunch of countries are going to start getting nukes, so it's okay. I think he made those comments in regards to um, Japan, uh, South Korea, and a few other countries he listed as well, um, talking about pretty much reneging on the Iran deal, talking about taking oil fields in Iraq and Syria, putting boots on the ground against ISIS, shooting down um, Iran. Iranian sailboats that like make inappropriate gestures towards Americans. It seems like Trump has said a lot of things that are pretty that would make me as an anti-war person really uncomfortable in regards to like his foreign policy. Yeah, and a lot of those things Hillary covers too. I mean, the Iran deal is maybe the one exception. Of course, she was most ardent on putting the sanctions on Iran in the first place. So was Obama. I mean, he co-authored the bill to put the sanctions on Iran to start with. Then the pressure from the military industrial complex is basically said, look, we're using the Iranian threat as an excuse to put our ballistic missile defense shields in Poland and Romania, which are aimed at Russia, but they say for the Iranian threat. So that came about not from the U.S., but from pressure from Europe and Asia because they needed the oil and gas from Iran. Fukushima hit. Japan got off uh, nuclear energy, which I think is retarded because there's nothing wrong with nuclear energy. It was a tsunami. We can argue about that if you want. But then uh, with Ukraine, the coup in Ukraine and Russian gas not going to Europe, they needed to buy it from somewhere. So that's why the Iran deal broke down. I don't think Trump's really aware of that. But as far as getting the oil, that's something Hillary also talked about. They, WikiLeaks has already released those emails, too, that, with Stephen Hatley. I don't. I mean, consider, well, considering we get most of our oil from Canada, I don't think that Hillary's ever made any comments that were anywhere near like as uh, not insightful. But I, I mean, any near, anywhere near well, the level of like we're going to go. It's not about. It's not about us buying oil. We get the majority of our oil from Canada and Mexico. We only get twelve percent from abroad. Most of it's from Saudi Arabia. It's not about us getting oil. It's about them not being able to sell it because that puts them on a path to economic independence. So they're no longer beholden to the IMF and World Bank and loans in this perpetual debt scheme. It's also about the oil not going to China. That's why we invaded Libya. Because after the Egyptian revolution, they reopened the Suez Canal to Libyan and Iranian ships, and Gaddafi made about $22 billion contracts in oil with China, so Europe invaded. 
and we put Al Qaeda in charge, and it's been a disaster. I had friends from Tripoli, and uh, it is a third world cesspool right now. And so that was a disastrous war. And Hillary was the Secretary of State, and it's not like she made those decisions all by herself. The French went in too. That war spilled into Mali, so the war got bigger and bigger. Surplus weapons ended up in the hands of the Syrian rebels. And Hillary's been back in Al Sham, as she calls the moderate rebels, and yet these people in a prisoner swap in uh, 2013 got Mohammed Zamar out of prison, and he was a 9-11 plotter. He was the money man for Mohammed Atta, who was the, the lead uh, hijacker for September 11th. So I don't know what universe you can call these people moderates when they're getting 9-11 plotters out of jail. And they've been cutting off heads and doing all the things like the FSA, ISIS, et cetera. Those people just switch hats. And this plan of helping moderate rebels to fight Assad, and yet we're also fighting ISIS at the same time, is convoluted. I mean, Hillary's admitted she knew Qatar and Saudi Arabia were clandestinely financing ISIS, and yet continued to accept money from them and continued to sort of fight a war on two fronts. And I, in my opinion, it's as disingenuous as Iran-Contra, because in, during Iran-Contra, publicly, we denounced the Contras. Privately, we were financing them the whole time and arming them. And that's what's going on with ISIS. And it's clear, because you can go all the way back to Judith Miller and the neocons and the, the, the war in Iraq, which Hillary also voted for. And this was the plan. It's based on Oded Yanan's policy papers of the real reasons why we're going into Syria. And she's been following it to a T. And then there's the Syrian gas attacks, which Hadley, by the way, in the email I'm talking about, Stephen Hadley's the one who was a director for Raytheon that, that advocated dropping missiles on uh, on Assad during the, the third gas attack, which, if you remember the chemical scare, where Alawites were targeted. So I can't, I can't support somebody who's covertly supporting al-Qaeda. And it's not a Democrat thing. The Republicans did the same thing. They financed the Mujahideen through BCCI and the Saudis and the, and the uh, Safari Club. And that was something else that Trump, whether intentional or not, he was saying to release the 28 pages all year long. They finally did in the summer. And it came back and it showed that Saudi royal princes were sending money through uh, Osama Basnad and Omar Bayoumi, uh, who were middlemen to finance 9-11 hijackers. But Hillary has gone back and accepting money from these same people and supporting their personal terrorist group in Syria to fight Bashar al-Assad. Now, only lip service does she give to say we're fighting ISIS, though. We can't fight them and finance them at the same time. And Trump's policy is, and he's very simplistic, but whatever. You know, he's saying, when you decide with Russia and Assad and crush ISIS, you can worry about Assad later. And I agree. Okay, so to, to speak to the, to the history, I guess, in terms of American foreign policy, I don't deny that America has had a very bad interventionist foreign policy in the past. It's something that I've never denied. It's something that I've never been a big fan of. Um, back good. when I was younger, I used to be a big Ron Paul bro, so I understand the, the concept of fucking around in the Middle East or other countries and, Me having, too. <laughs> sure, and having unintended you know, consequences befall us as a result of that. That all being said, I don't think any of the things you brought up were done by Hillary unilaterally, right? It wasn't like Hillary was the sole mastermind in charge of doing something. Now, whether she was pulled along or whether or not she supported these things uh, tacitly or not, um, I mean, I guess we could go through like every individual issue and debate each and every issue, although it sounds like you know a lot more specifically about some of these issues than I do. But that being said, looking at where well, Hillary can for, well, just to make it because that's like a mouthful that I just laid out. Sure. Maybe I should have done one at a time, but sure. Arad al-Sham, she continues to call moderate rebels after they did prisoner swaps to get al-Qaeda prisoners out of jail. Like, they are not moderate. There are no moderate rebels. The most moderate force in Syria is Assad. I don't he know if that's necessarily true. I mean, didn't conflict. I mean, there's a U.N. report on him using chemical weapons against like Kurdish people in Syria. I mean, is he that moderate? Yes, he is, because uh, that's contested. The, the rebels used gas on two attempts first. When the UN was there inspecting the second attack is when the third attack happened, and it targeted Assad's own Alawite, which Shiites, which he's a part of. And that, to me, and yes, you know, the Russians are siding with Syria, and the Americans are saying, you know, they all blame each other. But mm -hmm. if so, you look at the evidence, you go, look, there's no motive for him to gas like 12 people or something, or 70 people, whatever it was in the third one. It doesn't move the the meter in the war whatsoever yeah. it's just shooting yourself in the foot to use chemical weapons on some minor little attack like that on the same day the un is there inspecting them 
And then we found videos of the rebel groups with the gas, with Turkish labels written on them. It's written in Turkish. My former boss worked for the FBI as a translator. She was uh, Turkish, Farsi, and Azerbaijani. And so I, I checked this out with her, and they were killing rabbits. They were having these dead rabbits. They were using the gas, bragging about it. Their stupid music, all la, 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 stuff. Uh, most likely, they used the gas. I mean, they said the same things about Saddam Hussein, too, and it just sure. wasn't true. I mean, I don't think it's that surprising that any country would try to paint their enemies in a negative light and their allies in a positive light, right? I'm not, I'm not going to make the argument that the FSA is some bastion of free speech or some bastion of, you know, secular values in the Middle East that are trying to establish a democratic regime that everybody in the West would be proud of. I'm not right. making those arguments. But I mean, it's not that surprising to me that people would try to paint them in a positive light. There's a ton of propaganda that gets thrown around one way or another. I'm familiar with the UN report saying that um, Assad did use chemical warfare against people. I, now, you say it's fake. Yeah. It might be, but I don't actually know if that's true. Well, I mean, not fake. People were gassed. It just wasn't by Assad. There's no sure. motive or evidence for it. They just, they pinned it on him. But I mean, this is, this is what they do. I mean, the UN had resolution 1441 about weapons of mass destruction in Iraq. And they had several things, the aluminum tubes myth. There was the anthrax myth, the VX gas myth, the Niger forgeries about oxidized uranium. None of them were true. They came stovepipe by the Office of Special Plans by people like David Wormser and Paul Wolfowitz and Douglas Fyth and Richard Pearl, these Republican neocons. And it was one lie after another. And it's these same factions that are, you know, blowing the trumpets about Assad. And Bashar al-Assad was the president for 10 years, almost 11 years, before there were any conflict. And his vice president's a woman. I mean, he's very secular. And his, you know... Basically, the Sunnis are the majority, and he has all these minorities, Shiites, Druze, Christians, and whatever, in one group. And so, as a coalition, they stand up against the Sunnis. This Wahhabi faction of Sunni Islam, that's ISIS, the FSA, etc., and they're foreign mercenaries. And their weapons aren't even their own. I mean, Obama sent the non-lethal aid package. I'm sure you've seen ISIS driving around on these Toyota Hilux trucks, mm -hmm. all with brand new paint and everything. They came through Croatia to Turkey and then down to the FSA. But it's ISIS that ends up with them. We're always accidentally giving them weapons. That's the plausible deniability. That's why I see it the same way as Iran-Contra. And I correctly predicted Iran-Contra as a child. And I've been right on Iraq, and I've been right on Syria, too. The things, the internal memos and things about oil pipelines were things I made videos about in 2012 with a half a million views, and it's being vindicated. So I'm just putting that credentials out there with the gas attack with Assad. They never really offered any evidence. They, they looked at the gas. The evidence actually pointed the other direction, and there's no motive whatsoever for him to gas his own tribe in the middle of an inspection, in the middle of a so-called civil war. Gotcha. I can't, I can't speak to the specifics of the UN report because I'm not familiar with it. Even if you are correct in those cases, I guess what makes you think that if there's this giant military industrial complex with all of these, you know, foreign policy decisions that have been made, you know, throughout the history of the United States and all of these different parts of the government that have been involved in it, why would Trump take us in a more peaceful direction rather than a more aggressive one? What's, what's your rationale for that? Well, Trump in his kind of simplistic worldview, he has a sort of... Uh, a WWE pro wrestling white hats, black hats worldview. He just sees it as, and this is the right thing for the wrong reason kind of thing. He's like, you can't fight a war on two fronts. And this is what he said during the Republican primaries to Jeb Bush. He basically grabbed Jeb Bush and threw him in the locker and scram. It was funny. But he said, you can't fight, you can't fight Assad who's fighting ISIS and fight ISIS. It's ridiculous. Like kill the terrorist. He's very hell bent on that. And he's willing to work with Russia and Assad to preserve uh, Syria. And he says, these moderate rebels, you don't even know who they are. And I don't know how deep he understands that or if that's just you know how he speaks uh, to the plebs or whatever. It's hard to tell. But regardless, that is the right policy. We should be siding with Russia and Assad to stamp out these terrorist groups. But we wouldn't need any boots on the ground because if we stopped financing them and arming them, they would be gone in a matter of months anyway. 
And Hillary also supported boots on the ground. She was just more clever about it. She said, we're going to have special forces. And that's the same thing we've been doing in Afghanistan since 2014. Supposedly, we left. We have special forces. And we killed 36 civilians yesterday and two Americans. Uh, sure, but I mean, spe- special there. forces or training ops or whatever are a lot different than like a, like a full scale kind of ground invasion. Like what was like the difference between our presence in Afghanistan today versus like our presence in Iraq over the past decade are pretty different things, right? Oh, yeah, for sure. But that's what we have them in there now anyway. But what we're doing is uh, boots through proxy because we've got all these people from uh, Libya and all these Takfiri fighters and Saudis, Qataris, uh, all these foreign fighters, Kosovo, too. One of the ISIS commanders is a Kosovar, and he was trained in a Saudi madras school right across the street from Bill Clinton's statue in Kosovo. Bill Clinton's there from that pointless endeavor. And uh so a lot of these foreign mercenaries are coming from these schools. There are a network of schools that Saudi Arabia has put uh, like all around the entire Middle East where they preach this Salafist Wahhabi Islam. And in our own DIA reports, and Michael Flynn talks about this, the general, they admitted that the U.S. was creating a Salafist principality, and that was our intended goal was to create ISIS. They were calling them ISIL at the time, but same thing. Uh, to create a Salafist principality to fight Bashar al-Assad. And, and furthermore, Hillary's own emails also admitted that this was the goal to topple Assad because that's what the Israelis wanted. And, you know, Israel has a big lobby in the United States. Syria doesn't. I guess, I, I mean, like, if I buy what you're saying in regards to Hillary will continue this foreign policy in this direction, I guess I feel like it would be a stronger argument if I had heard Trump mention literally a single thing that you just said, which he hasn't. Well, he did. did in the Republican primaries. That's Wait, what he was saying. Mentioned what? He said you can't fight a war on two fronts and that we would have to side with the government of Syria and the Russians and stamp out ISIS. Sure, but his approach to fighting a war ha- has always been like insanely juvenile. Like his approach has been literal boots on the ground. He's saying like we never should have left Iraq, that we need to go and capture oil fields from Iraq and Syria. Like it's never been with any sort of nuance or finesse or with any kind of um, any kind of idea that he has like a well yeah, the, uh... un- understanding of what's going on. Like. It's like he's getting his talking points from Sean Hannity. Like, we never should have left Iraq stuff. We never should have gone into Iraq, for one. But, um, yes, we should have left Iraq, but not the the way we did because we just stationed contractors. We got rid of combat troops, and then they redefined the definition of what counts as a combat troop. This is the same thing Obama did with uh, nuclear weapons. He got a Nobel Peace Prize because supposedly he reduced the number of nuclear weapons, and Trump gets on their case about that. But we didn't, actually. All they did was, if a bomber holds X number of warheads, they count that as one, because it's one plane, rather than counting the warheads. So they just played with the math. We did not reduce our nuclear weapons. We have more than anybody. What we did is reduced it on paper. And that's what they did with the combat troops in Iraq, is on paper, yeah, we don't have as large of a military force there, but they did not reduce it as much as they announced. And then all these contractors in Blackwater and these sort of quasi-private, quasi-government entities are still there with troops. And uh, they're also in Kuwait. And so we never really left Iraq. So you, so you think that the, the big military pullout that was advertised and all of that, you think that that was mostly false? I mean, we, we did reduce our troops, some, but not nearly when as much some, as— When you say some, do you mean like what, like what percentage? You like, we really only like took out 10 percent or 20 percent or— no, we we took out probably 40%, but it's it's hard to say because we replaced them with mercenaries and contractors anyway. And gotcha. so Because it seems like as soon have... as we pulled out of Iraq when ISIS started to take over like shortly after that, I mean it seems if we still had a huge presence there or as huge as you claim we were hiding there, why would ISIS be able to gain so much ground? Because we started financing ISIS. That was the next stage was the after the Libyan invasion with Syria. They I mean This plan was spelled out by Richard Pearl, who was the defense policy chairman in the Defense Department. This is back during the Bush administration, uh, where Wesley Clark even came out and said, and he ran for president, if you remember. He came out and said, he's a Democrat, and he came out and said, we've got a list of seven countries they want to invade. And, uh, you know, if host 9-11, they're like, look, Cold War's over. Russia can't stop us. It's on. We've got all the clout in the world to take out the Middle East and and control these resources, da-da-da-da. And and Syria and Libya were both part of that list, and 
prior to that, there's the Oded Yanan plan from the Israeli strategist that was translated in English. And, and there's the Clean Break Papers, also by Richard Pearl. This is the architect of this whole thing, uh, stating the need and, and reasons why the U.S. would invade Syria and how they could use proxy forces. And that's exactly what we've done. Like, they literally wrote it down, Mein Kampf style, before they did it. I guess, like, and again, like, because I, 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 I can't speak to the depth of knowledge that you have about these particular things. But it's really hard for me to buy that Trump would take us in a different direction when I feel like I followed most of what Trump has said regarding foreign policy very closely. And nothing that he's mentioned has given any indication whatsoever that there was any kind of deeper anything like this going on. I, I guess, do you, do you understand it from my point of view? How? Like, oh, yeah. Well, Trump yeah. doesn't get he doesn't know what I anything that I just said. Hardly not anything. He knows some of it. But all he knows is don't fight a war on two fronts. Get rid of ISIS. You know, I'm I'm splitting hairs here because you're talking about Trump mm -hmm. or Hillary, right? Gotcha. So both are awful. Well, Hillary is more knowledgeable, but she's evil. I mean, she's accepting money from Qatar and Saudi Arabia. And so this gambit of fin covertly financing terrorists, privateer style, like the British used to do, that you know about privateers, that's not going to stop. So after Syria, it's going to be Lebanon and so on. And I just want this death machine over that Libya was a disaster and Syria has been a disaster. And all we have to do is stop financing them. Every time there's been a, a like Obama has been reluctant to have a uh, no fly zone, which is good because ISIS doesn't have an air force. So the only people affected by the no fly zone are the Russians and ourselves. And when they finally did that, they had a ceasefire agreement last month. First, the Israelis went and bombed uh Assad. Of course, they weren't part of the peace deal. So they said, well, if you're not going to do it, we'll do it. And then the Americans did it. And ISIS came at like coordinated air attack and ground force went in and they lost territory. Again, Russia was the only one that upheld their end of the bargain. They stopped bombing the terrorist groups. Of course, the Americans say they're bombing civilians, but the civilians say, no, we're being bombed by the Americans. So, I mean, they're starving um, so to death. And, and the same thing in Yemen, too. Like, they're starving to death and getting killed, and the Saudis are openly doing that. And we just gave them uh, $1.5 trillion worth of equipment, F-35s. That's Lockheed Martin's influence. And, you know, Hillary and Bernie both uh, gave money to Lockheed Martin in the trillions. That They always sign off on that. I guess I have a hard time believing that Trump could put a stop. If this has been the American foreign policy and Trump appears, at least outwardly, to be relatively hungry for some kind of increased military presence, I, I find it hard to believe that Trump would be able to stop all of this stuff if he's ignorant to it even going on. So. Well, I'm just assuming he's ignorant, but I don't think the people around him are. And Trump is saying he wants to make the military so big that so that we never have to use it. Is what he keeps saying. And he wants to have South Korea and Japan pay their fair share. Now, I'm with you on the Ron Paul philosophy, like, well, we shouldn't be in Japan and South Korea. Let's close the bases. But if they're going to be there, then they should pay for them rather than the U.S. paying for them. Now, it isn't really a lot of money they're going to save. South Korea pays for 40 percent of their defense anyway, and it's only like $800 million. So the cost of one F-22 plane, uh, you know, it's insignificant, really. But I guess he I said, so we never have to use it. So I, I mean, and speaking to both those points, I mean, our military is already big enough that we could probably march on multiple countries combined and, and win any war. Like, I, I mean, I don't think that our military is in such a place that like somebody could go to war with us and we would lose. Right. I, I don't think the size of our military has ever been a problem. It seems more like our tactics or the missions we choose or the situations that we involve ourselves in have kind of been the downfall of our foreign military related policy. No, not like having like how would having a bigger military have helped us at all in terms of how we approached Iraq or how we approached the uh, the Taliban or the Al Qaeda or ISIS or anybody today? It wouldn't. I don't agree with Trump on that policy. But what he was talking about is making spending more on the military doesn't make it stronger just more expensive and people look at the statistics and go yeah we spend more in our military than like the next 40 countries put together or something like that more than half the planet and but that's because of the the, the way our parasitic relationship started after world war ii you're paying half a billion dollars for one fighter jet that jet is not so superior to the next jet down. It's just it has that price tag because the, the U.S. is 99 percent of uh, Lockheed's budget is coming from government. And so there's no competitor. And so it's more expensive, but we're not that much stronger. Like 
I, we probably would win a one on one with anyone, but no Warriors one on one in our economy wouldn't take it. It would just be a disaster. But yeah, I'm so not I guess for, I don't, uh, it would be a disaster. And I don't see, I guess I, I just have a hard time understanding how, because Trump has spoken to increasing military funding. Trump hasn't said anything about making our military more efficient or making our military do more with its current budget. It always seems to be more increased funding to the military or make our military bigger and better. And then in, in regards to the, um, like, having bases in Japan and South Korea, like, this is something I hear Trump speak to a lot as well. Um, I, I feel like all of these bases that we have stationed around the world aren't necessarily just for the benefit. Like, when we put, like, a military base in, like, uh, like Estonia or whatever, I don't think we're doing that just for them, right? For the, for the, to be kind to them or in Korea or Japan. I don't think we're doing it just for them. I think that the United States enjoys the military presence we have around the world as well. Like, in some ways, we kind of buy access to the, that geography. Yeah, I mean, well couple points there bigger and better making it bigger is dumb making it better is good but hillary's same hillary's going to increase the military too i mean she's voted for every defense spending bill she was on the armed service committee she voted for all this pork for lockheed boeing raytheon etc and she has these tight relationships with people like stephen hadley who's a director for raytheon so there's no difference there mm -hmm. trump doesn't have those deep connections to the mic like hillary but he has an ideological like oh you know just Republican pro-military kind of thing. But the base issue, you know, I looked at that too, and I live in Japan, and so I hear a lot from this side of it too. And you can argue like, well, isn't South Korean base there because of North Korea and da 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 No, it's there for China. It's there for money. Like these bases would not stop a day worth of attacks. Like it's not significant enough to matter. It's just another place to use soft power politics because uh, – they use the military contracts as leverage to get Japan and Korea to agree to other things. Because the bases are so unpopular, they threaten to expand them, and then that's the, the stick. And then they say, okay, we won't expand it if you agree to ABC on uh, agriculture or whatever, some other unrelated thing. So it's like used as trade leverage, but not in the good sense of free trade, is in the kind of mega monopoly uh, – mercantilistic style trades that don't help Japan or the United States. It's just a way of of pandering to uh, special interest groups. So if, if we have these bases set up in these countries and these countries don't want the bases there, which I don't think I'm fully convinced of, maybe maybe publicly some citizens state that, but I don't believe... I, 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 it's hard Okinawa for me to... Okinawa doesn't want the bases there. Trust me. They protest it constantly and Tokyo just tells them to F off. Then in that case, then why would the United States have a base there? And and how would Trump, um, how would Trump coming up and saying these countries need to pay their fair share encourage keeping the base there? It seems like then at that point, then you would just roll back bases from all these countries around the world, or rolling back bases would be a good thing, but making them pay their fair share, the cost would actually be lower than it is now. It be, it's because that Japan has to pay seventy five percent, South Korea has to pay forty percent, that the price is higher. Because we're even though we're paying a fraction of it, the larger the total is, the larger their 75% is. And so even if they paid 100%, they'd be paying 100% of a price that was dramatically reduced. And so it'd actually be good for Japan. But the, they've got them so roped in, like uh, Lockheed Martin is just as effective on Japan as it is not as much, but almost as much as it is in the United States. They're the number one defense contractor every year for the last 12 years in a row. And... They also make, uh, in Boeing too, they're making commercial airliners and other things. And so they're able to, to threaten them uh, into agreeing to these deals every single time. And what, it, like, what is the threat? Like, that if we leave the base that we're going to like enact embargoes or sanctions against the countries? Or Yeah, trade and also it's a lot of money. Like uh, Shinzo Abe and his coffers are getting a lot of money. It's legalized bribery from Lockheed Martin and Boeing. That's why they... They decided for like New Japan Air and things like this are using the Boeings. Uh, not that Boeing has terrible planes or something, but you usually have market competition in these things, and they haven't. There's the Kodama scandal from the 70s on, like many times uh, where they've been doing this. But Lockheed served as a front for the CIA, which was building up the Yakuza post war Japan, which how we were spying on the Chinese. Now you can say, well, we need to spy on the Chinese. Well, but J Japan doesn't need to be doing it for the United States, though. Gotcha. 
I mean, I guess so. In looking at back, in looking back at what you've said in terms of rolling big bases, like these are all ideas, and I feel like this is the same with the Middle East stuff. These are all ideas that coming from somebody who's very intelligent on foreign policy, I could agree with this kind of collective move back, maybe from world politics. But I, I again, I don't see Trump as the guy to do this. Like, I guess it feels like to me when I listen to you explain these things, it feels like you have Hillary who wants to take, well, not take, but continue on in a foreign policy direction that it sounds like you disagree with vehemently, right? And then you have on the other end, you've got Trump, who is kind of walking around stumbling and completely clueless. And and it sounds like, I guess, your hope is that even though he's kind of advocated for warmongering in some ways, he won't take the military in quite, um, I guess, in quite the same kind of underhanded or really um, aggressive direction that Hillary will. Is, is that kind of the... Well, uh, he's basically just about as bad as her on the rest of it, like the bases and stuff. She's just as bad as him. He's just as bad as her. But he's better on Syria, which is a current major conflict. So stopping the war on two fronts is a, a big issue for me. I guess like when, And he wants to for, cut aid to Saudi Arabia, which is – fuck Saudi Arabia. I mean they stone women to death and they're starving kids in Yemen. So sure. that's it, a good thing. So in, in looking at – you say that he's better on Saudi Arabia. I guess like – to, to think of like a comparison, it sounds like a store manager coming in and then you've got two store managers, one who wants to move the store in one direction um, that maybe, you know, keeps wages for cashiers lower. And then the other guy comes in and he goes, I want to pay all cashiers $30 an hour. And then the argument is, well, at least that guy wants to, you know, give everybody $30 an hour. I'm going to go with him. Right. But the, 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 the argument from that store manager is so naive that it's hard to believe that not only could he enact anything if he was in the position to, but he probably doesn't even understand enough to do it. I feel like that's the same thing with Trump. Like maybe in a roundabout way, when Trump says something like we can't fight a war on two fronts, I guess like it, it sounds like you're filling in a lot of blanks for him that I, I don't know if he would fill them in the same way. Like when you well, say maybe he would roll back presence in like Syria or whatever, like how do you know he doesn't want to put 30,000 troops in Iraq and literally march on the oil fields being controlled in both countries and then hold it against Syria, you know, and have Americans stationed there, you know, perpetually? Like how do you know that he wouldn't take it in that direction? I think the analogy with the store is more like because you're talk, not talking about enacting things. You're just talking about stopping things we're already doing. Yeah, but what stop power does Trump have to stop it's more like, like telling funding... the, the store manager to stop taking a shit on the floor? Sure. Like, stop well, but if that floor, shit was being be taken on by like 15,000 different employees, right, and not just a store manager, like how is Trump going to start so much, stop so much of the military industrial complex when he's promised to increase funding to the military? How is Trump going to stop all of these different parts of government from what they're doing in the Middle East if, he, if he's not even educated on what's going on over there? They both want to increase spending on the military. I don't like him for that. It's just that the direction he wants to take the military is that he wants to stop financing Al Qaeda and Saudi Arabia because Saudi Arabia finances Al Qaeda too, mm -hmm. and he he doesn't want to continue bombing the Syrian army, which is easy as commander in chief. You say stop bombing the Syrian army. You don't have to go through Congress or anything. You say all right, that's the direction our generals are going to do. We're going to bomb ISIS exclusively and stop attacking Assad. And that's the right direction. I guess. In, so then in terms of, I guess, for, to poke out one specific thing there, how do you how do we ever put pressure on Saudi Arabia when Saudi Arabia has so much to do with, like, the, the way that oil works around the world and in terms of OPEC prices and everything? Like, how, like It is difficult. It is hard to deal with Saudi Arabia because even though the U.S. is not as dependent, a lot of our allies are. They, they gobble up that oil. They have the largest oil reserves in the world, Iraq number two. But you do not have to assist – Saudi Arabia and their war against Yemen, for example. I mean, we weren't before. We that started with Obama. Uh, not that you know Bush wouldn't have done it. He probably would have. But you don't have to assist them in that. You don't have to give them foreign aid. You don't have to sell them all these Lockheed products. Uh, you have to chip away at it. And you know, Saudi Arabia has been our ally in the sense of increasing oil production on purpose to to hurt uh, the Soviet Union back in the day, for example, because they're an oil exporter. But the Soviet Union is gone, and it, you know, there are other sources of oil, shale, and other sources of oil to buy. It's not going to hurt the United States so much. Europe can deal with Saudi Arabia themselves. But we cannot be supporting this backward, like, 15th century morality type of state and, and all, you know, throwing gays off roofs and all that stuff and starving. The poorest country in the Middle East is Yemen, and they're, they're just, their little bones are sticking out of their bodies and stuff. It's horrible. Like, I morally can't 
regardless of the consequences to Lockheed Martin, I don't care what if Lockheed Martin's stock price goes down. We have to stop killing children. And in the long run, peace and trade are more beneficial to economics. Yeah, I mean, I again, again, with I feel like we're kind of going through. It's like I agree with everything that you're saying. And if I heard somebody get up and give like a 15 minute comprehensive overview of our relationship with Saudi Arabia, how we could wean ourselves off of them diplomatically, and how there wouldn't be, or how we would mitigate like the insane amount of negative fallout of being on Saudi Arabia's bad side, I guess I would be more willing to buy into that. Can't not more willing. I, I would be excited to buy into that candidate's view of foreign policy, but. I feel like everything that Trump says just sounds so hollow and empty because of his, at least his, my perceived lack of, of his lack of understanding of how these things work. Like, it's the same thing with, um, like, economically, when he talks about, like, I want to bring manufacturing back to the U.S. by increasing tariffs on everything, right? That, that sounds the same to me as, I want to cut off funding to Saudi Arabia. Well, when so many parts of the political parties in the United States rely on funding from it, and when, you know, the, the world oil supply and the price of oil everywhere around the world relies on Saudi Arabia, I just feel like Trump isn't intelligent enough to enact any kind of policy or to be in a position to lead the enactment of any kind of policy that would seriously counter what's going on with Saudi Arabia. He just does, he just, and this is like my, my central point in Trump is that I believe that he's stupid when it comes to, to most of the issues he talks about. I don't believe he has the intelligence to tackle these issues because he doesn't understand them enough. I mean, Hillary said her own stupid things too. Like during the debate, she told the world it took us four, four minutes, minutes for a nuclear yeah. response time. Uh, that was dumb. But yeah. also during the same debate, she said Mosul was on the border with Syria. It's not. Now, I expect something that stupid coming from Trump. Mm -hmm. Oh, my door's ringing. Yeah, I'll give you a minute. That's fine. Just sorry. Anyway, Mosul's not on the border with Syria. Just a second. Sure. It's all the people from Okinawa. <laughs> How about the military base? Okay. Intermission. So, sure. I was just surprised that somebody who'd been on the Armed Service Committee and been on you know, the Secretary of State would screw up basic geography like that. She may have just been nervous or whatever, but... It seemed like a coach to answer, and like most of those, that's like saying Texas borders Canada or something. But I mean, that a lot of them do that. John McCain said uh, Afghanistan bordered Iraq one time. So sometimes these people that have been career politicians their whole life, they they don't even know where the cities are. And we've had this announced attack on Mosul for a long time, although we allowed 9,000 ISIS fighters to leave. <laughs> Trump was right about that. I don't know if he. Uh, it seems like he has smart people telling him things, and he repeats some of them, and he'll be right, you know. Because, but then you look just from listening to him speak, it seems like you didn't figure that out by yourself. Like that's what it seems. Sure, like. when he but, stumbles on like one nugget of truth or whatever. R regardless of, yeah, I mean, he called the Huma Wiener thing back in 2015. Kind of, yeah. I mean, it's like, yeah, well, somebody knew. I knew. Well, then I, you know, I mean, like a broken like, clock. I mean, he tweets a ton of ridiculous shit. I mean, every now and then something is yeah. probably bound. Uh, so, um, climate change is a hoax from China. <laughs> yeah. Um, in regards to whether or not Mosul is close enough to be considered um, on the border or whatnot, I, I feel like it's possible that Hillary might misspeak. And again, like I feel like, yeah. as I said in the beginning, I think that um, Hillary's foreign policy is the least tenable of her positions. But I mean, I she blamed it. Benghazi on an internet movie. She said she was dodging bullets in Bosnia. Like, she said some stupid... No, yeah, the, the bullet thing bullet. in Bosnia is actually fucking disgusting, especially because she rolled back on that story a lot, like trickle truth it down, and the videos of her literally hugging like kindergartners on the tarmac is yeah. really, really... So that, it's bad, but the movie. The, you remember when they blamed a movie on the internet that was like offensive to the Prophet Muhammad or whatever? When we got attacked on 9/11, it, it wasn't in Benghazi. And it didn't no, have to do with the internet. interview, did it? They had. A, there were prior attacks on Hadley's or on Stevens' life. Ambassador Stevens. They blew up a bomb in front of his hotel all before that movie was ever on the internet they'd been trying to kill him sure and but, he got killed in the same manner as gaddafi like it was connect the dots but they didn't want they're like oh is this a random revolution based on an internet offensive movie on the internet sure which made everybody go watch the movie on the internet like they could not admit that what steve was actually doing was he was procuring weapons from uh, surplus weapons from gaddafi's stash and sending them through lebanon into syria to the fsa sure so e even if you believe that like Hillary has misspoke or whatnot, though, back to my original point, Trump is in no way like if Hillary and Trump were to ever have a debate on the geography of the Middle East or the history of the Middle East or anything going on there, right? That would be like a one, whether you agree or disagree with Hillary's policy positions, it would be like a complete total one-sided stomp, assuming that Trump wasn't being financed, right? Would, like, but neither one of them would know anything. Like you don't think Hillary, I mean, with all of her experience, he... no, she she 
there are a lot of people with a lot of experience that couldn't do it because they don't give a damn. Like they just say what the PR firm tells them to. And like, I, I think they would both know like Baghdad and Aleppo. They're not as bad as Gary Johnson or something, but it would, you would surprise you on how little either one of them know. I mean, this is a woman is like, you mean like with the cloth? Like, well, I mean, that answer is being facetious. Can she be that stupid or no, is no. she that stupid? I, I, that, that was a stupid, sarcastic answer, which I agree was stupid. But I, I have a hard time buying into both positions that Hillary is an evil, corrupt mastermind who was funding so many different players in the Middle East to further her own goals. But she's also too ignorant to have any idea who anybody in the Middle East is or any of the history of that region. Like, I feel like both yeah, of those. She's not positions, a mastermind, though. She just said she just does what she's told. Like, oh, they paid me for influence so we'll say yes like uh qatar and the muslim brotherhood qatar owns al jazeera aj's been putting out nothing but leftist propaganda all over facebook and the internet and this they were not like that before but all of a sudden qatar's uh social media outlet they call it aj now instead of al jazeera they do these three minute videos are completely like social justice warrior fucktards doing fluff pieces on race and sex and stuff like that which i just think is stupid uh, how did this like hardcore like Muslim Al Jazeera outfit do all this leftist propaganda? And then you find out the relationships with the Clinton Foundation and how much money Bill and Hillary have been taking for Qatar, and it starts to make sense. And she's admitting in 2014 that she knew Qatar and Saudi Arabia were covertly funding ISIS and did nothing about it. I mean, they want to fund ISIS because, like, I think you brought up the point earlier, like, how big our military is. Couldn't we stomp someone? It's our tactics or whatever that are bad. Yes and no. I mean, that the purpose of war, we want prolonged conflicts because perpetual conflicts, perpetual profit. If you if you fight and win the war quickly, you don't make any more money. I feel, where does all of the profit come from, from these kinds of wars? Because it seems like they're just drains on both public uh, perception of government and from our economy in general. Oh, our economy definitely loses money, but certain corporations make lots of money. Like, I call Vietnam the war of helicopters and heroin. We were there for nine years. If we wanted to crush North Vietnam, we could have done it in a matter of weeks. We never even went on the offensive, but Huey was losing 20. This is from Bell, Bell Helicopter from Texas, where Johnson was the congressman before he became vice president and then president. They were losing 20 helicopters a week. So they got to replace 20 helicopters a week. That's a nice cash cow for them. It's not good for the United States because we have to pay them through our taxes to buy all these helicopters and shit. But it is a way for these uh, military companies, weapons makers, to make tons of money. Talking trillions of dollars. Sure, but I, I have a hard time believing that like the military industrial complex could lobby the government harder than the rest of the economy, especially when Wall Street is so involved in our political system. I have a hard time believing that the that uh, Lockheed Martin, you know, companies that talk about layoffs and having trouble, you know, getting financing for their new projects, which they've been fighting for, um, are somehow able to out lobby, you know, the the multi hundreds of billions or trillions of dollars that go through like Wall Street and these other mega corporations. How how can they lobby so effectively against all of that money? Because it's not against them. Most of the time, they have overlapping interests. There is no peace lobby. There is a war lobby. So think- it's like zero versus trillions. Wall Street. Uh, a lot of the financial institutions in Wall Street are are backing and investing in these weapons companies because it's a no shit investment. If you start a war, the price will go up. Like whether it's logistic stuff with Halliburton, KBR, et cetera, they were they were going up like thirty three percent a a year during the Iraq War. Uh, Raytheon makes missiles. Uh, you, you create a crisis where there's missiles, and their stock price will go up. And so it's equivalent to insider trading because you've got people like John Kerry and and uh, the John Kerry. <clears throat> Cohen, whatever his real name is, he, he was part of the, uh, what is it, Natick, the, the body armor, uh, camouflage, I forget the company's name now, but uh, interceptor armor, that's what it was. And they were spent $5 million picking out a particular color green, which they had Ralph Lauren provide. They had another color by another company. Like, Many different companies were making one uniform just to put a certain color on there. It ended up looking like gravel. The soldiers didn't even want to wear it because it was like gray and green and white. It had every color on there. It looked like a stupid rainbow. It, 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 the camo wasn't effective in any environment unless you're laying in a pit of gravel or something. Uh, but they did it because that's what costs the most. It's the same with the Bradley fighting vehicle. We have so many projects that are there. Not because they're effective, not because it's useful for the troops. I mean, they made the walls of the Bradley out of aluminum because of Alco. Uh, that's the lobby. So a lot of these like other uh, companies 
are under the umbrella company of the MIC. So you're talking about steel, aluminum, like the raw resources that go into these things are benefiting from these things. So they're not opposing the lobby. They're actually assisting them because the MIC is the umbrella corporation for a plethora of other industries. And then those industries hold leverage over others. So if you've got the aluminum industry, then you've got leverage over Coca-Cola and beer companies and uh, aluminum smelting. And so a lot of aluminum, for example, comes from the Russian oligarchs. And so you're looking at a very tightly bottled neck kind of industry on the top that it has people by the short hairs. And so when you look at big ag, when you're going to go to Walmart, McDonald's and things like that, the parent company above that, they've got to buy their raw food stocks and milk and cheese and everything from somebody. And that's getting government subsidies, which rolls into NAFTA. And NAFTA destroyed the Mexican economy and it's free trade on paper, but because our agribusiness is subsidized by government and Mexico's is not, how are they supposed to compete with that? And that wiped out the agrarian society in Mexico, which over, you know, pushed uh, uh, wage labor in the cities and wages dropped. And then they come across the border in desperation and help their families. I don't blame them at all. But, you know, if it wasn't for NAFTA, we wouldn't have an immigration problem from the How, South. For, for just, I guess, just looking at NAFTA, I've never heard that claim before that NAFTA destroyed the Mexican economy. How, how how has NAFTA damaged Mexico's economy? I thought that was almost universally agreed upon to be a very positive thing, like so much so that even Trump has called it out, saying that the United States has been scammed on how NAFTA worked. Yeah, NAFTA did not help the Mexican economy is what I'm saying. NAFTA, Trump has said what a disaster it was. Hillary refused to answer it. She just, she changed her position on TPP, <clears throat> which I agree with, but not for the reasons that they do, but whatever. I, I just take it as a win. If they do the right thing, I don't care if they understand why, but Bill Clinton started NAFTA and uh, it wasn't a loan. Like they all passed it, you know, but uh, NAFTA has not been good for Mexico and not really good for the United States either in the long run because you get, it's a combination of things because it's not only wiping out the agricultural base in Mexico, it's on top of that, we get the largest corporate tax rates in the world or second largest, it's like 35%. And so of course people are going to pay people under the table so they can avoid that and avoid those payroll taxes on top of that. Even if it's the same wages, it's a win-win for the employer and the uh, employee. But if you were to reduce taxes, then maybe businesses would stay in the United States and they might hire American workers as well. I guess, I mean, so I, I just, just because I'm just looking up a couple numbers because I, that sounds so outlandish to me, or from what I've heard at least. Like, So how do you explain mm -hmm. the fact that Mexican farmer exports to the United States have tripled or the hundreds of thousands of manufacturing jobs that have moved to Mexico as well? Like, I, This is kind of in line yeah. with... I've never heard that like Mexico's well, economy was destroyed by NAFTA. The NAFTA wasn't the reason for manufacturing jobs. Manufacturing jobs moved to Mexico because of the corporate tax rate in the United States. The U.S. businesses moved to Mexico because it's cheaper to do it there. But NAFTA hurt the agricultural business in Mexico, which is they were an agrarian society. Now, their exports have tripled, but the prices have not. Uh, United States and Brazil export more food, I think, than anybody, but... You're a lot of that from Mexico. You're talking about like vanilla and certain products that they do have niches on, but <clears throat> across the board, it's been bad for them. Like NAFTA has not been a good deal. What I guess, like, in what what are the major negative ways that you think that NAFTA has impacted the country? Like, what figure or effect? Like, if I were to look at purchasing power or median wages, like, what 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 I guess what would have been like on an uptrend, but was severely destroyed by the implementation of NAFTA. Uh, mainly in like agriculture, fruits and things like that, <clears throat> which you have a lot of them um, migrating to the U.S. to pick fruit because they can't compete with the sales of the U.S. Now that on paper, it looks like, well, look, uh, sales are up because you'll have a U.S. owned business in Mexico hiring people. But on a corporate level, they're losing money. But Mexico is made up of oligarchs. I mean, you've got these ultra rich millionaires and then pretty fairly compared to the United States. Uh, a much lower standard of living for most of the populace. Gotcha. I, I, I guess I see that, um, I mean, I see that like corn farmers were hurt by NAFTA, but I, I feel like you're presenting it maybe like in a little bit more of a negative light than it, than most people agree it to be. Um, I don't know. Well, I, corn farmer is a good one because like the former president of Mexico, Fox, was also the former CEO of Coca-Cola. <clears throat> and Coca-Cola is using corn syrup. Mm -hmm. And corn syrup subsidized by the government of the United States. 
that's the reason why corn syrup's in a lot of things instead of sugar. Like uh, Coke in Japan is out of Kyoto is sugar instead of corn syrup because Japan doesn't grow a lot of corn. But it tastes almost the same. But yeah, I don't know the specific agricultural stocks off the top of my head, but I have looked at it in the past. I'm not making this shit up. Like, sure. <clears throat> yeah. Um, so I guess to finalize, because we kind of got away from the foreign policy, how do, how do we get to NAFTA right. from... Oh, wait, wait. from foreign policy. I don't remember. I went to get the door for something. We were talking about Mosul. Um, oh, and then we talked about um, information that both candidates would have on uh, foreign policy, or knowledge, I guess, of of the area. Oh, the were... tariff thing too. I don't agree with tariff, but well, I get, I okay, well, we, we can go. Well, I think we should go. I feel like could lower the taxes. But... Maybe yeah, we should we should do the tariff later, since that's an economic thing rather than a foreign yeah, policy thing. Sure. How, I guess. How do you feel about Trump's stance on things like Israel? How Trump has called for more support of Israel, and Trump says he's the most pro-Israeli candidate. I mean, I got a Palestinian flag behind my head, but t the thing is, there, I hate his stance on Israel. But I mean, it's fine to be an ally if they didn't have a racial apartheid state. But Hillary's the same thing, so it doesn't matter. Do you think do you think the Democrat support for Israel is going to be quite as I don't want to say militant, but as extreme as like a, I feel like one of the uh, hallmarks of the yeah, Republican Party has Bill, been support Bill for Bill Clinton was Israel's best friend, like more so. Like George Bush's father was the last person to stand up to him, and George Bush Jr. did get the settlements out of Gaza with his roadmap plan. So he did something, but they're all, I mean, ninety nine to one hundred percent for Israel. But Israel's never had a better friend than Bill Clinton. So, so I don't think Hillary would be much different. Like she's she stated in her own emails, like the primary reason to topple Assad is because of Israeli pressure. You don't feel well, like it might be a little bit of anti-Russian sentiments as well for the Assad. She thing? uses that as a, but you know Russia wasn't even involved for the first four years of that conflict. So no. Yeah, but I don't she think just, Russia wants to lose Assad. Right no, Russia's ally. doing. Russia is not like. It's not like they're supporting Syria for, for philanthropy or something. They don't want to lose their only remaining base in the Mediterranean. They don't want a Sunni corridor hooking up with the Chechen terrorists that the CIA financed to harass the Russians. Like, they're doing it in their own interest. It's not because they care about the Syrian people or anything. It's because it's within Russia's interest to do the right thing. It's, they're not doing it because it's right, though. They're doing it because it helps themselves. Uh, in their own interests. It's not like just for Syria. And the U.S. is doing it for the Israeli interests. I mean, Israel has the most powerful lobby there is. Uh, arguably, MIC and Israel are, are like neck and neck in that regards. I mean, that's why I went to war in Iraq. The real reasons for the war in Iraq were not weapons of mass destruction. Those were the pretext. Israel wanted to topple Saddam. And it was a bunch of Israeli partisans that came up with every single pre-war lie. It wasn't oil. We could have bought the oil for a lot less than what it took to steal it. Uh, and it didn't end up with it anyway. <laughs> Oil went to China. So despite but, the uh, fact that Trump and the Republicans in general come out so hard for Israel, you still think he would be the one that if Israel's the primary driving force or factor in, in us having you know presence in Syria in, in whatever capacity we do, why, why do you think that Trump would be able to turn a blind eye to the Israeli pressure there if he comes out so strongly for them? Because um, – Trump doesn't understand that Israel is the reason why we're in Syria. Trump just thinks they're a bunch of terrorists called ISIS, and we need to get rid of them and side with Assad. And But he is against the Iran deal, which Bibi's against the Iran deal. So on that regard, he's closer to Israel than Hillary is. But, I mean, Hillary was for the Iran deal when it was beneficial, and now because of, like I explained in the beginning, why she changed her stance on that. Has Hillary said, come that, out against the I Iran deal? She no, she's for the Iran deal now. Okay, but she's the one who uh, originally put the sanctions on Iran in the first place. But that was the whole point because the Iran deal isn't really a deal, like Trump believes it is. The Iran deal, uh, they haven't gotten any of their money back yet, and it's just something that sort of placates well, them. Well, we've, we've given one them tiny infraction, and we go, aha. We've given them some money back, back haven't we? Uh, wasn't that the point of the, was it 150 million or whatever that we shipped via yeah. plane that Trump missed? We unfroze his... their assets, yeah. but they still haven't received them. And like, they're still not allowed to use the dollar to buy petrol, which is retarded. Like, there's this big group out there that talks about the petrodollar. And I'm like, I can't stand these people because they just watch movies on YouTube and they don't know what they're talking about. Like, we, people buy oil in the dollar and they buy reserves because of convenience and because of to fight against rapid inflation. That's all. Because nobody wants to buy oil on a currency that, by the time you get it, it's not worth as much as when you bought it, and the dollar is the most stable. That's why they use it. But Iran got off of it, and they're actually losing money on that. I'll send you a, a link on a podcast about that because it's, it's complicated. But 
the money we said we've given them back, we did unfreeze some assets and start to say, okay, well, these aren't frozen, but it's it's trickling in a little at a time to make sure this new government in Iran, you know, is behaves the way we want them to. I guess because at any point we can withdraw it right away. I don't necessarily see it as a contradictory position to be in favor of sanctions on Iran and then move towards a instead of sanctions we can move towards some kind of diplomatic approach to to, to no, figuring out Iran's it's problems. Not a con- I'm not saying it's a contradiction. I'm just saying she originally uh, pushed all the sanctions on Iran when that's what Israel wanted. Mm-hmm. And then because of pressure of Europe and Asia, they said, well, you got to let them buy oil. But as far as us unfreezing their assets and trade, they are allowed to trade with the French and things like that. And they are. And so some businesses in Iran have, are are making up for it. But this the sanctions really devastated them. I mean, it was you got to remember the sanctions on Iraq. You're talking about hundreds of thousands of children starving to death. About 800,000 kids died, and Hillary supported that, too. That's just why he's like an ethical person. I can't see Trump saying, oh, 500,000 children have died. Okay, no problem. Like, I don't think he would support that. <clears throat> as, well, but he said, mean he had, I mean, he uh, said some kind of extremist things in regard. I, I guess this moves into other topics. Um but but I mean Trump has talked about like um, I guess for instance like bombing uh, bombing truck drivers that are driving oil out of Syria you know and transporting it to Turkey when like Trump has said things like why do we drop leaflets for these guys like let's just go fucking blow them up because he thinks the people driving the trucks are ISIS members like I feel like Trump has said kind of similar things that in his um, in his bravado that that could lead to harm to civilians I guess he people would argue driving that. people driving the black market oil across to Turkey were ISIS members. Are, are you sure? Are the, the impression that I got that was uh, most of those people were people that had just made a living doing that kind of stuff. And the reason why the leaflets were dropped is because these guys weren't ISIS members. They were just people that were looking to make money running oil back and forth from the oil, oil fields to Turkey. Yeah, I don't think bombing them from the air is the best thing. I mean, you could have spiked the road. You could have done a lot of things to stop the trucks besides just blowing them up. But that black market oil was strong armed by ISIS and uh, and, and not just ISIS, there's a whole bunch of rebel groups, but mm-hmm. Tur- Turkey was selling that black market oil and uh, oil also from the Kurds through their pipeline. They is a Kurdistan is how they refer to it in northern Iraq uh, because they're no longer getting the Syrian oil and that was a placement is to steal it and sell it on the black market. Sure, I guess so. Um, but, but, but I mean, the people driving the trucks weren't ISIS terrorist members, right? Or do you agree with that or do you disagree with that? I disagree. Um, it's hard to say every single person because a lot of, you got to think mixed in with those trucks are just cars on the road. You know, they're innocent. So that's a better argument. Just saying, well, the, that's not a truck. There's a bunch of trucks, but there's some people just driving, you know, going to Turkey for whatever. <clears throat> but uh, in the whole in a war, like you got to stop the flow like with this. I don't agree with war, period. But if you are in a war like that's what happens, like. You, if they're mixed in with civilians, some everybody, every nation kills civilians to kill the enemy. I mean, whether it's Ho Chi Minh Trail or whatever, they're going to bomb it. And uh, if you got it in the long run, you end up saving more lives. This is a shitty kind of like decision to make. But if you stop the illegal oil trade into Turkey, Turkey has basically been brought into the fold now mm-hmm. because the sanctions on Turkey economically with tourism and stuff, and then the bombing of the airport by which is most likely ISIS. <clears throat> or some al-Qaeda affiliate, got Turkey out of Syria. I mean, Turkey is starting the side with the Russians now. They're they, they are having conflict with the Kurds internally in Turkey, so they have conflict with the Kurds fighting in Syria. They don't want them to carve out a piece and have another Kurdistan on the border of Turkey. I understand their interest in everything. But in Russia stopping their oil flow to Turkey, that was the the main leverage left to, to keep the Turks in. And they also warned Erdogan of the coup against him. And so Turkey has been removed from that conflict. Now it's just Qatar, Saudi Arabia, and the United States uh, versus Lebanon, Iran, and Russia, and Syria. So removing a player was worth it for a few truck drivers. Sure. If if you look back at how um, if you look back at how you disapprove of Hillary's stance on Iran in terms of, or it sounds like you disapprove of the extreme sanctioning that went on that that Hillary and Obama supported and co-authored bills for for what happened with Iran. How, how do you feel about Trump's position right now? of wanting to go back to sanctioning the hell out of him or I, I think what did you say he wanted to make the sanctions twice as bad as they were before yeah. whatever he's quoted as saying you can't make them twice as bad because they're as bad as you can make them um he won't be able to do that i'm not worried about it because to get those sanctions obama had to go out and beg and plead with it because the europeans and asians are like why what benefit is it to us to stop trade with iran 
We make a lot of money. We buy a lot of gas and oil. What is it? So the U.S. had to offer a lot of things to do that, and Trump will not be able to get them to do it, so I'm not worried about it. I'm a pragmatist. Like, I'm just being realistic. He can mm-hmm. do all his New York hyperbole he wants. He's not going to be able to get sanctions back on Iran right, because so, he, the U.S. could refuse to buy oil, but we already don't buy any oil from Iran, so who cares? Like, oh, you're going to go from zero to zero? So, uh, But as long as the Europeans and Asians and others are doing business with Iran, the Iran's economy would be fine. But the sanctions were placed on for erroneous reasons. They said they were doing uranium enrichment for a bomb. They never had above 3% enrichment. You need 90% to make nuclear weapons. So it's just a disingenuous excuse to begin with to put the sanctions on Iran. It doesn't benefit the United States to put sanctions on Iran. It benefited the Israelis, and that's the only reason we did it. Gotcha. I guess like, I guess it sucks because I can't speak to every individual issue, but it sounds like so your position essentially is that Trump, on every position where Trump could do harm, that Trump wouldn't be able to get it done. And then in every position where Trump can do something good, even though he's ignorant, his ignorance causes him to do the right thing. It's kind of like what it sounds like. uh, Just that position, really. I mean, most of the things he wants to do bad, he could do. He'd continue his support for Israel, for example. He would, you know, talking about deporting 11 million people or whatever, uh, even if he got a fraction of that done, it's it's just, it's pointless. Like, strike the root. If you... If you quit exporting bombs, you won't import refugees. And if you if you really do negotiate the trade deals, then you won't have so many migrants and stuff. So it's a kind of two prong problem. But most of the things that he would do bad, he'll continue to do. But so would Hillary. So it's like, yep, he sucks on Iran. So does she. He sucks on Israel. So does she. I mean, well, how can you both- how can you compare like their stance on like Iran or Israel, or, or I guess we could just in Iran? Like, how I mean, it seems like Hillary, for the most part, wants to continue supporting the Iran deal that Obama laid out, right? Yeah, but there, like I said, the Iran deal isn't. It's like the generous offer deal. It's not so good. And sure, I, it's better I, than going back to that. like the massive sanctions that Trump wants to enact, right? Rolling back the deal altogether and saying "fuck you, Iran," right? It seems like Hillary's at least a little bit better on that front, no? Yeah, Hillary can't take another position because Obama has already made the Iran deal. Sure. And so it's like, yeah, which she, is... as a Democrat, she would lose her base and everything. But yeah. I don't believe her. Like, she's initially was hardcore putting the sanctions on Iran. And now she's going, what she's going to do is say, oh, they violated this small thing. We got to put the sanctions back. Like, I could definitely see that happening. But it, for me, the foreign policy disaster, the biggest thing is Libya and Syria. I mean, that's where people are getting murdered and also Yemen. Gotcha. And so she's then... supporting it. So those three countries, I, I kind of side with her more on Iran than Trump, but I don't believe her position on Iran. And then uh, Trump's better on Syria and Yemen. And then Libya, he hasn't, he badmouths it, but he hasn't really offered a solution. So they're kind of neutral there. Sure. So then, so then we agree that a worst case scenario for Hillary's position on Iran would be a best case scenario for Trump, right? Because Trump has already said that he'll do what the worst case scenario for Hillary is in terms of rolling back the deal, reenacting all of the sanctions as she did before. More or less. Right? But no, because he can't, because the sanctions are a multilateral thing. It's not a unilateral thing. Like stopping the bombing in Syria is something that a president can do because he's commander in chief. Getting the rest of the world to put sanctions on a country is up to those other countries. Is it really, though? And when you're talking about the United really, States and not presence? very big fans of Donald Trump. Like <laughs> the, the rest of the world doesn't really like him very much. And it was really hard to main. We maintained the sanctions for as long as we could. And after Ukraine and Fukushima, especially the coup, with the, when Gazprom stopped sending gas into Europe, and Libya is not sending gas up through Italy anymore, so they so, have to buy it. Well, how, else. How, how can how is it that Hillary would be able to repeal the deal in Iran, but Trump, who says he wants to repeal it, and a Republican Congress that say they want to repeal it, wouldn't be able to? It, it seems like you're granting like every best case uh, scenario think, for Trump and every worst <clears throat> case scenario for Hillary. I don't think Hillary will be able to finesse it either. I think she wants to. That's all. Like if just from an ethical point of view, she will not be able to get the Europeans and Asians to agree with her either. She can just she can do the U.S. portion of it. She can freeze assets that we have and things like that. But she's not going to be able to to uh, go back the way it was when she initially put the sanctions on because that that ship has sailed. Like until you resolve the problem in Ukraine, which she's not going to do because she helped start it and Libya, which she's not going to do because she helped start it. Uh, then it's not going to happen. Gotcha. And as far as Japan getting off nuclear, I cannot see. Although I, there's been a lot of shit said about Fukushima, and they show this m- wave map, you know, and they're like, "This is radiation. It's hitting California." It's not true. But the public here is 
just isn't going to go turn them on again. So the Japan imports 99% of its oil and gas and coal and, and all the fossil fuels. So and that's why Sharp is uh, makes 50% of the solar panels in the world. But I guess this is a tangent Japanese stuff. Sure, but, yeah. So, yeah. so then do you do you at least agree at least a little bit that Hillary is probably has a better position on Iran than that Trump does, or do? You... Oh yeah, I, I, that's the one thing I've said about Hillary is her Iran deal. Like she's agreeing with it because pulling teeth. I don't think she's sincere about it though. Sure. But we, but that's something I think I know Trump isn't sincere about it because Trump doesn't like the Iran deal. I think it was the stupidest deal. Whether he wants to make a new deal or go back to the sanctions is bad. But it, because he won't be able to do it because it's not a unilateral decision. I'm not worried about it. And for me, the weight of the Syrian conflict is much more important than the deal with Iran. Like gotcha. And then. In, in so far as like in so far as like the Syrian conflict goes, so if Hillary continues on the path that we are on right now, I think that you know the conflict continues. I don't know if Assad will ever be detoppled. I don't or toppled. I guess depending on how. I don't think you really want him to. I think they just want. They keep saying Assad must go, but they want to prolong that war as much as they can to tear Syria apart. They're trying to balkanize the region. Sure. So. We, we know that that's Hillary's plan. Wouldn't a worst case scenario under Trump, doesn't that have the potential to be much worse than anything that Hillary is trying to push? Whether that's uh, troops Hillary's on the ground in Iraq scenario. or troops in the ground. Hillary's talking about a no-fly zone in Syria. Are you going to shoot down Russian planes? Because that could be a major world war. That'd be the worst case scenario for her. I think she's just talking shit. I hope she's just talking shit because she could be the president. And if you really put a no-fly zone there and Russia, and, you know, what will you do? Are you really going to shoot down a Russian plane? Sure. And I don't. That? I, I know that she has made those comments before, but again, I mean, we both know that that would probably necessitate World War Three, right? If she were to actually do that, because that would involve, or maybe they'll say there's a no fly zone well, that would actually enforce it. I hope maybe, maybe, I mean, if you shot down a Russian plane, there would be severe consequences, but the, hopefully the rest of the world would be like, whoa, whoa, whoa let's not start World War Three, you know, but. But it's probably I mean, not something you would want to risk, right? I, I don't want to roll the dice on that. But if we're going to hold the standard of like worst case Trump versus worst case Hillary, Hillary's World War Three. Sure. So that's but I, what I feel like if I were to have a conversation with Hillary, if I were to tell Hillary Clinton, if I were to say, Hillary, you know, if you start shooting down Russian planes, that shit is going to go crazy, right? And she'd be like, yeah, I know that. I'm definitely aware of that. Whereas if when you listen to Trump talk about ramifications of things like Trump, you know that you can't just shoot out like Iranian boats because the guys, you know, like flip off American sails. You can't do that. And Trump would be like, no, nah, we're America. We're so strong. I feel like Trump's position on how the rest of the world would react to his, um, I, I guess, bravado. But do, you, before, like, do you remember the Strait of Hormuz incident during when Obama was president, where we nearly did start a war with Iran over the exact same scenario? And then we found out from the audio recordings that uh, the Iranians were not firing on our ships or anything. So they almost faked it. They almost had another Gulf of Tonkin just a few years ago anyway sure but starting uh, a war over somebody firing on our ships is a far cry from you know some sailor flipped off our big boat and now we're gonna go bomb them and nothing bad is coming sure but right? but again nobody fired on our ships like they're better at making an excuse and this is what trump is just saying on twitter too mm -hmm. like he is he's a new yorker and a lot of new yorker everything they have a lot of hyperbole it's all like everything's great tremendous or it's wonderful and or it's completely horrible completely terrible there's no middle ground that's just how they talk you know, but uh, uh, I'd rather, I mean, if you want to roll, say that happened, war with Iran is not as bad as Russia. Like, the her policies of a no-fly zone in Syria, like, they've found out without Turkey's support, especially now, they're sitting there with their dick in the wind because they can't defeat Assad. And ISIS is getting crushed right now by the Russians. And so they're saying we're going to have to put up a no-fly zone. And I think that she thinks that, Russia doesn't want World War Three, so if we put up a no-fly zone, they're just going to stop bombing. That's what she's hoping. Is that with Putin's position on the constantly encroaching NATO with the threat of losing the port that they have in Tartus or whatever in Syria, did, I, I feel like that's not a realistic position. I feel like you can't expect Russia to just give up Syria completely, to lose they're their They're not presence. going to. I mean, Russia is going to continue bombing. I mean, Turkey did shoot down a Russian plane. And massive sanctions were placed on on Turkey. They get a lot of their economy from Russian tourists. And Turkey was broken by those sanctions. And so they shot down a Russian plane, and they are a NATO ally, so Russia did not just stop, start, you know, bombing Turkey. Mm -hmm. But uh, Erdogan had a coup d'etat from most likely Fethullah Gulen, is what he's saying. Although Fethullah Gulen is like an 80-something-year-old jackass living in New Jersey now. Even though he's on Interpol's most wanted list, we protect him. 
uh, he is just the face for our intelligence assets, which train all these madrasa schools for Saudi Arabia to foster Wahhabi Islam. And so Turkey was going from mild extreme Islam to even more extreme Islam kind of deal. And but the Russians tipped him off, so they've they've pulled them out. But that was an incident where a Russian plane was shot down. It didn't start World War Three. Uh, however, it well, they, but shot that, down by the Turkey, Russia not the United States. Shot right? down by Turkey, it's, but it was shot down by a NATO ally. Yeah, I mean, it's Turkey's in NATO, and so but, the but reaction I mean, Russia was also is kind of Turkey, but Russia had the ability to to take Turkey out without having to fire a shot economically. They were Russian do that. planes flying yeah. over Turkish airspace there anyway, though? That was their claim, and the other and Russians said they were not. I, I tend to believe the Russians because what's the point? Why would you fly over their airspace? You're just bombing the, the uh, terrorists in Syria. There's no reason to fly over Turkey. Well, like, if they're no, bombing the terrorists in Syria, though, if you believe that Russia is bombing the terrorists in Syria, like Russia does do a lot of bombing in Syria that isn't bombing ISIS, right? They do bomb FSA people or Turkish supported people. Well, I, I consider the FSA as terrorist too. Oh, okay. All right. So because um, they've been killing babies and everything else so they are terrorists so sure. yeah they've been bombing the moderate rebels but the moderate rebels are getting al-qaeda operatives out of jail like there are no moderate rebels sure i, I don't i don't disagree with that there um I, I i thought when you say terrorists i was thinking isis but i don't i don't agree with the phrase non-moderate rebels so I, I understand what you're saying um I, I guess the only point that i was trying to make was that turkey shooting down a russian airplane for supposedly violating their airspace whether or not they did or didn't that's the message that was presented to the rest of the world i think is a lot different yeah. than the united states shooting down Russian planes flying over a no-fly zone established somehow unilaterally by the United States. So that carries a much different connotation with it. And the likelihood of like global conflict stemming from that would be much, much, much greater than what happened with the Turkish. Yeah, it would be, that would be a lot worse. And so that's why I don't want Hillary to do that. Like, I would assume Hillary would try to have the Russians agree not to fly before she put the no-fly zone in. Of course, they're not going to, so she won't have a no-fly zone, but her pressure and her rhetoric against Putin personally is like George Bush Jr. with Saddam. Like she has it out for him, and you know th- that her foreign policy is horrible across the board. Trump's isn't much better, but that situation in Syria is really important. And that, to me, I'm not rolling the dice for World War Three. I'm just not going to do it. Like, and I guess like I agree. We that always I just... think this shit can't happen, but like that's how all of them have happened. Like we all we're not going to have World War, but we did twice. You know, that's how it goes. And uh. You know, she doesn't need to be making no fly zones in Syria or bombing Assad. Like, Assad is the moderate is the moderate in this case. But you know, she's getting too much money from Qatar and Saudi Arabia to change her position. I mean, it's pay to play. Sure. I, I mean, I guess I can't really disagree then if you think that Trump is either isn't capable of putting group troops on the ground in any of these places or won't get the support to push through any of the you know foreign policy things that he wants to do, which seems to be your position that Trump won't be able to get the support to put troops on the ground in Iraq or put troops on the ground and take over oil fields or anything like this that you don't think he's got the He's capa- been talking about using drones to kill terrorists and their family members, but we do that already now anyway. So Sure, but I'm talking specifically in regards to putting putting soldiers back on the ground, either in Syria or in Iraq, or, you know, are arming Kurdish people yeah, in, I- in not, Syria. He doesn't want to go back into Iraq. He said we ne- the way we left was wrong and we should have left troops there, but he doesn't want to go back and reinvade Iraq. He's saying, like, he criticized the attack on Mosul, like, why are you announcing it and waiting till October to do it? And da, da, da. But uh, his main thing is to fight ISIS in Syria um, through the air, working with the Russians and the Syrians. The Syrians and the Iranians are on the ground. And, you know, if that doesn't work, will he put in ground troops? The thing is, if we stop aiding and arming these al-Qaeda groups, it is going to work because they just showed up out of the blue. Like, bam, there's ISIS and they have all this communication and anti-artillery and all the tank, you know, tow missiles and stuff, American-made weapons. Where'd they get it all? Mm -hmm. We gave it the FSA. But the FSA is ISIS. I mean, it's like the same way we arm the Contras. We just use intermediaries. It's, It's how every operation works like since you and i have been alive they launder money through rigs or bcci which is now defunct and narcotics traffic and then they uh arm them through proxies we, we did that um over and over again we started vietnam war that way with our advisors and shit before we put the military proper in there and they learned like oop, that's a mistake because that was very unpopular and we had a draft and people got killed now we use proxy forces sure and uh I guess like, but so I, 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 Iran. I mean, Iran has proxy forces in Syria, and Hezbollah is fighting with uh, ISIS too. But 
they're defending themselves. I mean, that is their country. That's where they live. That is their president that they elected. <clears throat> they had peace for 11 years. And then uh, they started this thing off by snipers shooting police and got a reaction, the same way as the coup d'etat in Ukraine, uh, which Ukraine was just going from one oligarch to another oligarch. I guess uh, Mr. Chocolate. Do you see how somebody could like be of the mindset that it sounds like Trump wants to put groups on the ground, troops on the ground, and march like to war in places in the Middle East, do you, based on everything that he said about doing that? I think, I think because of the kind of leftist push on like how much he hates Muslims or whatever, mm-hmm. that they think Trump is just going to be like, go oh, and drop nuclear weapons on the Middle East or something. Not but, nuclear weapons, but I mean, he has said well, that he wants he a ground him, presence yeah. like back in the Middle East. Like he says that he wants to do that. Right. Like the, I'm pretty sure like an exact, I could find like a 30,000 troop exact quote about like putting presence back in the Middle East again. Like, yeah, I don't know if he understands that we're already there as contractors, but his thing is he wants to side with Assad and that's that he's not going to start a war with Russia and Hillary might. I mean, that's the maybe yeah, but, uh, I guess but it's and I, not supporting Saudi Arabia either. And they're currently killing people in Yemen. So sure, but if, again, you, like, if but, you stop that support, it unravels the whole thing. Yeah, I guess. But again, like like he doesn't side with Assad with the very limited information or, or he wants to side with Assad with the very limited information and understanding he has of the political situation over there. And like he wants to cut off funding from Saudi Arabia without having any idea how he's going to do it or how that would affect the world economy. Like all of these things, like just reek of like hollow, empty, almost I don't want to say demagoguery, but just like preaching to an audience that wants to believe these things. Right. Like I, I like I, I think I have a good idea of what you want in the Middle East. And it sounds like you're um, you're. you're not projecting, but like injecting a lot of your own ideas into how Trump will function without Trump ever having actually stated that any of these things are his goal. Like a more like I, I guess after looking at everything yeah. that Trump has said about the Middle East before talking to you, like I would never have this impression in my mind that Trump wants a more peaceful Middle East with less U.S. intervention. That doesn't sound did like you something. Watch the, did you watch the Republican primaries? Yes. And these are things that he has been saying, what a mistake the Iraq war was and Syria, and not the fight of war on two fronts. And, and uh, Yeah, he, well, he he's saying that now, but he's also said he wants – like when Trump said – like I feel like when someone says to you it's a mistake to fight two fronts, like maybe you as a rational person is thinking, OK, well, we need to pull back here. We need to refocus. We need to have a concise mission, and we need to figure out what we're going to do. But when Trump says it, it sounds like we can't fight a war on two fronts, so we need to really quickly obliterate this front by throwing tons of troops and tons of bombings, and then we can go obliterate the other one. Like that's – like everything that Trump has said has never been along the lines of we need to tactfully withdraw from here. We need to stop supporting these groups. We need to be very careful about who our allies are. Instead, it's I want to bomb the oil fields and take the oil fields you know to clapping and i want to put troops on the ground here and roll these people over and like yeah he like, said what he would have done uh-huh. uh but not what he's going to do what he said he's going to do is support russians and syrians to fight isis not talking about thirty thousand ground troops or anything like that and he has said that hillary clinton should get an award from isis for being their founder like he is aware that the united states has been aiding supplying weapons and money to these terrorist groups and all you have to do is stop doing that. It's not like something you have to enact. It's just something you have to quit. It's really easy to quit doing something compared to like starting something, initiating something. Like you can tell them to knock it off. And you can threaten Saudi Arabia and say, look, you're not going to get this aid. We're not going to help you in your war in Yemen because you're aiding ISIS fighters. Hmm. You know, that's going to pick up allies in other places. It's good to be friends with Russia, which he said, I think it would be good to be friends with Russia. Hillary, not so much. You know, she thinks Putin's the incarnation of Satan kind of thing. Like, she blamed WikiLeaks on Russia. She actually said, like, well, they could be, and she blamed the uh, Democratic, or the HRC, whatever. She blamed the attacks on Russia. And she said, oh, they're just falsifying emails and stuff. She's lying. Like, she has 650,000 wiped emails now and stuff in this Wienergate thing. Like, it's pay to play. It's the same thing the Clintons were doing in the 90s. Like, it's not a big shock to me. She's just an establishment, run of the mill, you know, special interest groups, whore, politician. That's it. Uh, and Trump isn't like, and he's. I can't get excited about either one. Like, it sucks. We're gonna have Hillary or Donald Trump. Like that. That already sucks. But uh, he is the better choice, not just on foreign policy, but healthcare and trade and many other things. Like, there are a few things. One thing I, I definitely agree with him on is uh, getting rid of the regulations, protectivist regulations on insurance companies that won't allow competition across state lines. Like that would bring the cost of healthcare down. And that is a regulation that really could, uh, or deregulation that would really work. The thing is, are you going to be able to get 
get them to do it because you got to have Congress's support on that. But at least he brought up the issue. Uh, at least he's talking about solutions. That was a Ron Paul plan, too, to have competition across state lines. Because yeah, our, he, the mean, healthcare in the U.S. is atrocious, and Obamacare was a step sideways, if not backwards. Uh, yeah, I, I don't know if I necessarily agree with that about the Affordable Care Act, but in terms of like protectionism versus non-protectionist policies, like he says he wants to remove protection from you know different types of industries across state lines, but then he wants to throw up protectionism around the entire United States economy to try to withdraw manufacturing from China and Mexico. Aren't those positions a little bit contradictory? And how does he even plan to, to even go about doing that or funding that or making that affordable for United States companies? It's not contradictory because they're, what they're saying is like between the states, the states have the same like standards on health and environment and labor and, and rules. And so allow it's just like cell phones. You allow competition and the price goes down. When you're talking about places like China, you're talking about, well, they can out manufacture us because they have essentially slave labor where people live at the factory with suicide nets and things like how are you supposed to compete with that? And Tariffs should punish states that don't have any concept of human rights or environmental laws. Or anything. And it's like, yes, you can cut corners on the environment and like and pollute the air like China has and outproduce other players. But, you know, we're, we can either lower our labor and environmental laws down to the level of China, which would be a disaster, or we can tariff products coming in from there. So then for all of the people of lower classes, middle, lower class, whatever, that, that do the majority of their shopping at Walmart and get all of these products for cheap, how do we all of a sudden account for the fact that goods are costing, you know, twice as much because now we've somehow managed to move and rebuild all of our manufacturing in the United States? Like, well, I, it wouldn't cost the United States as much to build our own products if we didn't have a 35 percent tax plus a payroll tax on our own corporations. And if you got rid of if you deregulated what the initial capital need for startup businesses and allow more competition too, you're going to have prices drop internally. I, I feel like these are all like thing. you can't just continue to say, well, it's OK that China has essentially slaves building shoes because I want to buy shoes at Walmart or whatever. Like slavery is wrong. Sure. Even if it, it it works, like yeah, yes, but I mean, it's like free. What, what, the cotton what, is free, but that doesn't mean it's okay. Well, yeah, but I mean, like, what's the? I mean, what's the alternative? This is a really shitty argument, but looking at the Chinese well, workers, the, what's the, the alternative is, for them like, working at the factories, working at like these subsistence farming places where they're, you know, working for in each, China? Yeah, I mean China. Yeah, we all to fix China is a bigger problem, but China. No, I mean, like you like talk about, like cutting out the economic model of of Japan or any other Asian nation that is seen, South Korea. They seem to be able to have a functional economic uh, model with a high standard of living with their population without you know skirting labor and environmental laws. Well, wait, are you talking like about South Korea? Sure, South Korea or Japan. Yeah, but these places are fully developed countries. Like the way that Japan grew was under insanely high protectionist policy and the, um, you know, a ton of assistance from the United States government in protecting them and getting them rebuilt. I don't think that you could compare like a developing country like China to the same kind of development China has standards. China the second largest market in the world. It's bigger than Japan's. Like Japan is number three now. Like J China is not some third world cesspool. Like they no, do but they're have still developing though, right? Population. Yeah, it's certain areas, rural China especially, is developing because they were communists for a long time. And communism doesn't work. Like, And they have an oligarch system now. It's democratic on paper, but not really. And, you know, it's, fixing China is not my problem. I live in the United States, and fixing China is something I'd like to do. If I, I wouldn't want Xi Jinping in there. Like, But uh, there are a lot of reforms you'd have to do in China, and it's going to be very difficult to do. I mean, I think governing a billion people, you're going to have problems. But – you know, slave labor, one thing <clears throat> that would help China is outside pressure. If we quit buying their shit that they make with their slaves because they have slaves, then that would put pressure on them to, you know, pay a fair wage instead. Sure, but I mean, like, so, if, so as long as we're going to keep buying their slave labor products, they're going to keep making them. Sure, but I mean, just speaking to a couple of things, you said that you weren't, you weren't, um, you didn't care about like reforming China or fixing China, but then you made it sound like one of the reasons why you wanted to throw up these tariffs was out of ethical concern for the people of China. So, so I, I want to, but it's because, because I don't live there and all, I don't know how to fix China. Like, yeah, well, what should we do about China? I'm like, well, maybe they ought to do the models that, you know, other Asian nations have done, but that's not my responsibility to like get into the internal politics of China and say specifically what they ought to be doing. But I know that putting outside pressure on them not to use slave labor would be a good idea. Okay, so then if we were to, you know, tariff them or force them to pay any kind of, you know, monetary compensation that I guess we deemed was fair, wouldn't they just up it to that and then we would just pay a little bit more? Like, how are we ever in the United States 
going to be competitive with China on manufacturing? Do you really think it's just as easy as lowering some taxes? Like when China's already got the manufacturing base there, wouldn't China do everything they could to cut costs to be competitive with, with United States manufacturing? Like it, it feels like the idea of just raising tariffs and somehow all of our manufacturing jobs come marching back. That just seems. No, nah, it wouldn't. You couldn't just raise tariffs and just low and just lower taxes. But those two things are are steps in the right direction. It, China is already starting to outsource to Burma and other areas where it's even lower, but they're basically near the bottom. Like you've got your forced labor, like you can't get any lower than what China has right now. They are basically no environmental laws. There are no real labor laws. They can do whatever they want. They don't pay workers sometimes. Sure. Like, and even in China, and so. even in China where they have these incredibly lax laws and because they're a developing nation, they, they get to be lax on so many things that are catching heat for it. Even China has been losing a lot of uh, labor to automation and whatnot. I just don't see us pulling back I just don't see a road forward. Like you said that, you know, cutting taxes and, um, you know, increasing tariffs wouldn't bring back jobs, but it'd be a step in the right direction. Well, that's a step into disaster if we don't actually bring back all the manufacturing jobs, because now we're just paying more money to other countries for goods, and we didn't actually accomplish anything except for... No, I'm saying that's not the only things you'd have to do. Like, then that's not the only things that Trump is asking for. I mean, Hillary's talking about raising taxes, and she wants to increase the payroll tax, which is going to hurt industry. And, you know, she's saying, oh, we're at the 1% to pay their pay their fair share. She's full of shit. She voted for every single bailout and gave trillions of dollars to these Wall Street tycoons. Like she's she is the one percent. Like so is Trump. But Hillary's voted for every single bailout and every single war. I mean there's trillions trillion tens of trillions of dollars spent on her imperial escapades and bailouts to Wall Street. She's just full of shit. Cutting taxes uh, down would prevent coupled with the tariffs, you have to have a, a cost benefit analysis. It's like, well if I'm gonna have my goods tariff to get back into the country and I don't have to pay 30, a third of my income or more in taxes, maybe I'll stay here. And if that happens, you have the more factories and manufacturing you have competing with each other, the lower the prices are going to be, the more jobs are available. I mean, Kennedy proved that. And so did Reagan, you can lower the tax rate and increase the tax revenue because it's better half a loaf of bread than none. Because if it gets to a point where it's too high, they just go overseas and they use the loopholes that are available and they manufacture overseas and they send it in with no tariff like that's if you continue that policy we will lose all our manufacturing sure but i mean i don't think that the reason why china has the advantage on manufacturing is solely because of taxes and i understand that you're not saying that that it's solely no, due to that but like if you look at it the other because they have a billion people I yeah mean, yeah yeah a fuck ton of people that, like, that also have much lower standards of living than people in the united states are accustomed to right. as well um, when you look at like ta Trump's tax plan and everything, though, like every single, um, I think the tax policy review and the um, tax foundation center, or whatever, like of all the big organizations that I've seen review taxes plan, like all of these guys project, you know, like double digit, like ten trillion plus dollar deficits over the next decade, like as a result, even taking into account possible <clears throat> economic growth, like uh, yeah, that, but they've been wrong over and over again, just like the rating agencies, like. The rating agencies got bribed to lie. This is one of my favorite things that Hillary did in the debate. She blamed the 2008 housing bubble on tax cuts. It had nothing to do with tax cuts. You had these uh, lending institutions giving subprimes uh, mortgages out to anybody with no credit or paper or anything, and they divided that from the lending institutions from the investment banks. And the investment banks turn around and bribe the rating agencies to give AAA ratings to CDOs, which had no collateral or debt obligations. They were just like a roll of ones with the 20 on the top, a bunch of subprimes combined with, you know, maybe one legit mortgage. And, you know, and that can't last forever. But they had the incentive to sell as many subprimes as possible because the burden of it, they passed the securities over and sold them to investors through faulty ratings. That's why we had a housing bubble, it had nothing to do with the tax cuts. But she just says that over and over, like, didn't you like the 90s, like when the personal computer came out? Like, she did. She just, she says shit because she knows what I just said is too hard to explain. So she's like, Bush tax cuts, which Obama codified, by the way, like they didn't repeal those. But the, these, these people that are reporting on Trump's tax plan, they said the same shit and ended up wrong, dead wrong on the housing bubble. And, and then others, Austrian economists and stuff, predicted it and explained why it was going to happen, like as it was happening and before. <clears throat> but Kennedy, they said the same shit about JFK and JFK lowered the taxes and ended up with more tax revenue because businesses stayed in the United States. I mean, haven't we been like playing the, the kind of like the lowering taxes and the tax evasion for the past few decades? Like it doesn't seem like it's helped in terms of if you're looking at income inequality or median pay for families, it doesn't seem like it's helped so far kind of playing in that direction 
what I, well, I guess like at what point it seems like there too. When, okay. when you when you look at like a, when you look at like a Trump policy or what you're advocating kind of the uh, the, the supplied side kind of thing like at what point are the taxes too low like do you, do you just make the taxes like two percent and then all of a sudden you know everybody's got all the money and the revenues will continue to grow well, he's or? talking about fifteen percent so which is a dramatic down, decrease from dramatic especially decrease the highest from payers yeah you know? from so from the biggest corporations that's a huge source of revenue but. Hillary's drawing the line like what she's saying is the rich is two hundred and fifty thousand dollars a year. Like for a business that's not that wealthy actually. Like that's every small business basically. So you know, people like to focus on like the McDonald's and Walmarts and stuff and they'll get around it anyway by offshoring, but your your local businesses, if you continue this tax rate of over a third of their income, like uh I have family members that have businesses. They're like, look, they they had 20% more revenue. They'd hire more people and expand their business. It is like that simple. Like, what if you didn't have to give third of your income over to the government? Especially when the government, it's not like that money helps the poor. They spend that money on bailouts and war. That's what she actually did with it. She spent over $19 trillion well, I mean, the major, I'm pretty sure the vast majority of our budget is spent on social programs, isn't it? It's like some 60, 70 percent of our budget is spent well, yeah, on. Yeah, because they include Social Security in that statistic. But Social Security is your own money. Well, and right that, now that's not necessarily true. I mean, most people get more back from Social Security than they pay in, even when you adjust for gains on the market or inflation or whatnot. Like, I, I think that most people, Social Security is a net positive to the money that they get back from it. But but I mean, regardless. No, it's of, not because of inflation. When you're on a fixed income, you're actually losing because even though you get X amount, if you if the inflation has been as rapid as it has been since the housing bubble, then those people are really hurting because their checks are not going as far as they were when they first got the check when they turned 65 or what have you. And, and Ron Paul pointed out in the debates if you're with Bernanke, not the debates in the president, but when he's talking to the, the former chairman of the Federal Reserve, people on fixed incomes are, are getting screwed uh, by this hyperinflation. And if you were not spending about you know $23 trillion on bailouts and wars, then we wouldn't have this rapid inflation. Well, how I I'm not aware of any. I don't think we've had any inflation since the housing bubble, have we? I, I mean, like, I I try to keep up. Yeah, we always get three percent a year minimal, like the well, dollar. The, the three percent is do the is average. They compare to, uh, yes, yeah. I mean, we're always we're always spending trillions on something. This thing we always have wars. It's not just like the Iraq War is the first intervention we did. I mean, Reagan was guilty of it. Bush Sr. was he invaded. Yeah, Panama sure. But, but I mean, like when you look at in terms of like what inflation has been like over the past decade compared to what has been historically, I think it's been lower than average. And if you compare the strength of the USD to like other currencies around the world, like I think the USD is at like an all time high. I know that we've been beating Canada. I know we've been beating the euro. And obviously we've been doing much better against the pound. We're not beating the euro. We are beating the Canadians. We always historically do. compared to how we've been versus the euro. I'm pretty sure we're. Well, they started. Well, well, look at the problems that the Europe is having with refugees and their own social programs. Though. Sure, like, but the regardless is, of the problems they're they having, like, the, you, compared to each other, we look better. Compared to the purchasing power of like stuff you can buy, like on a basket of currencies. If you look at the consumer price index, if you look at the CPI, it is not going as far. Like, uh, was it Congressman Goodlatte of uh, Virginia was talking to uh, people at UVA about that, and they're like. We don't know about that, but we know about going to the grocery store and things becoming more expensive. Like, yeah, the purchasing power of the dollar, if you want to do a exchange rate, that doesn't matter, like how many euros, dollars, yen, you win, whatever. What matters is how much food and gasoline and everything can you buy with that dollar? The purchasing power of the dollar is, keeps going down. That's real inflation. It's not just the prices versus other currencies. I mean, using gas is a really bad example because I'm pretty sure gas, gas is, is bad very low. Sure. And the but, cost of gas goes like, into manufacturing and groceries and whatnot, too. Cheese, butter, milk, things like that. The prices continue to go up. Like, how much was a Coca-Cola when you were a kid versus now kind of thing? Um, I, I, don't, I don't think that's – I don't think that the um, – I don't think that the CPI has been really – I've interviewed bad, economists you know? about this. I mean, I, you know, Peter Schiff have had um, – Jim, Jimmy Rogers, and he on said the that he stuff. said that the inflation index has been higher over the past decade for the United States than the historical average. Yeah, because what he did is he took the consumer price index and looked at that, which is the real purchasing power of the dollar. Not like you can you can uh, put it up against the basket of currencies, but you have to see that. But they are inflating too. Like Japan's had rapid inflation. Like they used to be, it used to be. 125 to the dollar, and then it went all the way down to 75 to the dollar, and then back up to, I think, 109 or something right now. It's been bouncing all over the place from the spending. And then the euro, 
you know, the EU has been a disaster for them. And because of Syria, uh, and you've got this influx of refugees and a lot of spending on social programs, which, like, look, if someone's a refugee, like, fuck, you got to help them, you know, like, they're, they lost their home, they're poor, whatever, you got to do something. But, you know, if we changed our foreign policy, we wouldn't have these as so many economic problems, which is why, again, the foreign policy on Syria is so essential, because that is affecting the refugee crisis in Europe. And not all of them are refugees from Syria. They're just refugees in general. From Northern Africa, I'm not at all. Yeah, I'm aware of that. So, um, I, I and, guess. But then again, like even though they're not war refugees, like they're economic refugees. If you didn't have the IMF and World Bank going down there doing predatory loans on purpose, then it wouldn't cripple the that neocolonialist policy in Africa. It wouldn't cripple those economies either. Like that's something that has to change too. And you know, I don't know who Trump is going to you know appoint for these kind of things, but. Because usually, like, people come out of the Treasury Department or something, and then they go and work for the New York Fed and so on. Like, but it's got to be better than it is now. He seems to know business, at least. I mean, like, I, I don't. I'm, I'm just like real quick because a lot of what you're saying, um, I know to be not true. Like, I guess just in looking at like different indexes, like, I, I don't see the inflation stuff that you're talking about in terms of the United States. Even it's not even reflected in the CPI. Like, I don't believe that there's this dire economic situation that Trump has been presenting that people can't afford milk or can't afford, you know, whatever thing that's been inflated so much. Obviously, since I've been a kid, you know, there's been inflation. There, there is always inflation. Yeah, they can't but, afford milk. It just costs more than it used to. That's well, but, but even that, like, I think that all of these indexes have been more or less rising in equivalent fashions at least for the past decade like i don't think there's been any massive spike um especially as of recently that the, unless there's some other index that's accounting for this that's not reflected in the either inflation index or the cpi like i, I don't see any of these numbers well the, the cpi they do what they do is to combine stuff like gas into the cpi and gas prices have gone down because production has gone up but on agricultural products and other things it's it's not been the case uh, for basically your necessities if you're talking about the poor you're talking about grocery products mainly i can send you the numbers i have and uh, i mean this is something like i feel like you need time to, to, to yeah research. go yeah i can't go over so all of it right i'm not now. gonna i'll just say what that's that and we can look at it later or whatever but like i don't have a, a dog in it like I, why would i care like if it was the other way then i wouldn't agree you know what i mean like i'm not a republican or anything like that like i made a all these films demonizing the Bush administration. Like, I'm not a Democrat either. Like, I don't have any kind of party loyalty or anything like that. Like, the the CPI and things, what I've been honestly taking an objective look at the economies and having economists on and explain things to me. And, you know, just because a majority says something means nothing because it's so politically motivated. And we get that all the time, like, even in science. Like, they used, they used to say, cigarettes were healthy you know and shit like that they used to say the earth was freezing yeah but uh, but, the, but the amount of the degree of certainty that they make those claims are a lot different than other claims made today right i mean i don't think that it's well, economics is the worst though because like they didn't see the housing bubble coming uh some people did and those are the people i talk to those are the economists that i talk to and have on the show and they're the ones saying well according to cpi these are the real numbers are they are those the guys other people that got everything wrong i'm not interested in talking to for the guys that got everything right these guys are all multi-billion dollar people that shorted the market before it crashed right they have to be right if they absolutely knew these things with absolute certainty and weren't just calling economic because i know there are a lot of people that will call an income and economic um, crisis every other year but if these guys actually millionaires they're definitely millionaires. I, mean, I don't know if they're billions, but they're definitely millionaires, and they did, uh, they did make money. As far as like shorting securities is kind of difficult to do because it's they're the CDOs were. It's not like a common blue chip stock or something that you just call a short on. Sure. But so, I mean, there are other companies that are invested. The, the large Wall Street banks that are invested in doing these are all companies that could have been short, or shorted, right? Those securities, kind of in a in a, in a one way, one layer removed kind of way, right? Yeah, well, like individual employees at the companies probably did the ones who saw it coming. But well, but, I, but I'm talking about the guys, the economic experts. I hear a lot of the time you, t you we hear about economic experts that totally saw something coming and predicting it. But well, then when you go back and look, they've been predicting economic disaster. Somebody akin to I didn't, this is almost insulting to compare whoever you talked to, but somebody like Glenn Beck will say something like every single year there's an incoming economic disaster. But these right, people, and then when there is one, he'll, he'll be the broken like clock. A, yeah, you look like a like a genius, or whatever, right? So I have a hard time believing that you know. Did you? Short, you know, like Lehman Brothers or somebody, you know, like hun like hundreds of thousands or at least millions of dollars. If you knew for a fact that these crashes were coming, that these CDOs were going to be toxic, like did yeah. You well, part of uh, part of why Lehman Brothers got hit so hard was because of all the naked short selling that went on, 
and then the DCC didn't didn't allow they, no one's been subpoenaed, which is blows my mind. Well, not really because we they run by pay. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it, it it doesn't blow my mind. It's exactly what I expect. But you ought to be subpoenaing these people. And I mean, even during 9/11, people were shorting the airline stock. So there was a little bit of foreknowledge from somebody there because. Well, I've never they, heard that claim before. That that not only did people know that a, a terrorist attack was imminent that was going to change the world, but they only did that to make a little bit of money in the market. That seems a little bit unbelievable. Oh no, it's just that uh, you know there was there was chatter about uh, a terrorist attack involving airplanes, and so they they specifically sold short stocks on American Airlines and the airline the Boeing that were involved in 9/11, and. Uh, I always wondered, like, well, that's not illegal because you could just say I was lucky. Yeah, I just, I just bought that. I didn't have like, is you can't prove someone had foreknowledge, but it's just when you're talking about the, the magnitude of uh, short sales is circumstantially suspicious, but it's not like proof of anything. Gotcha. Um. I don't know. I feel, I feel like I, like I'm still getting the feeling when I'm when I'm talking to you that you're you're injecting a lot of like your personal beliefs or hopes into Trump's actual policy. Like whether it was the foreign policy or for the economic thing when we talk about trade, you're saying that taxes and tariffs wouldn't be enough, but you hope that he would somehow go further. I I, I guess in, in regards well, to no, that, it and what, because he does. His plan is the taxes and the tariffs and the deregulations. Yeah, but when you, you say deregulations, his his idea of deregulation is to get rid of the EPA. Like what like what realistic deregulations yeah, i would get rid of the epa and the department of education but why then why would you criticize I, mean, I am older than the department of education it's not like they create education the department of education has made about 67 billion dollars off this student loan gambit it's an unnecessary body and the epa the the epa standards have hurt the environment how, so what, the park how, service and and the uh forest reserve these institutions aren't really there to, to help the environment if if why would you be critical of Chinese manufacturing when it comes to polluting the environment, but then be okay with destroying the EPA? Like I don't understand. How you can make the claim. I guess when you look at China how, has its EPA too. It, they've got their own, and what they do is they set the standard at almost zero. What our EPA did is like it actually avoided uh, allowing um, c competitive cleanup for the oil spill in the Gulf, for example. Like the things they've done. And through the uh, like the Park Service and Forest Reserve and their predator control, basically like wiped out a lot of animals in our parks and things like that. Like where I lived on the island where I grew up, the Park Service closed the beach uh, on an island. The, the economy dropped like 70 percent. And you know they're doing this to the pretext to protect some piping plover, but really they found out they got paid more to police it than uh, than they did to provide access now you can go to the beach but you have to pay the park service uh for a permit to do it so apparently as long as you're giving them money you no longer hurt this bird right of course the bird was never being hurt it was just it's just a way of uh you know using public parks that they privatized they made money off it through these federal institutions and so there's so much corruption there the problem is People were like, well, I'm pro-education, I'm pro-environment, who isn't? You got to be a fucking idiot to be anti-education, but that's not what the Department of Education does, and that's not what the EPA does. They have a nice signing title, so does the Patriot Act, but the Patriot Act is not patriotic, and the EPA is not really about helping the environment. It's just about like bottlenecking contracts to make sure that you know certain companies get more money for cleanup and benefit off of natural disasters. So it's... I would get rid of it. I would get rid of the Department of Ed too, and save all that money. Like things, our parents were so educated what, in school without a Department of Education. So was I for a couple of years. Like, well, I, to some extent. Okay, hold on. For, so going back for the EPA, if you let's say, okay, let's say that we buy. I don't believe in your premise that the EPA has done nothing for the environment, especially when you look in certain cities in like California that literally used to have like smog alerts and shit. I don't buy into that. But let's say that we do believe that. Let's say that you get rid of the EPA. How do you handle any environmental? regulation at that point then you just hope that companies do it on their own even if there's no financial incentive for it or hope that like no, a, a mean, bad pr campaign happens and that maybe people get caught out or the same way we did before we had an epa the state's already yeah set but before ready. we had an epa we had like smog alerts in los angeles and shit like we had like yeah, acid that, rain and shit that like, wasn't re that didn't get reversed by the epa that got reversed by innovation yeah but what, so what, what way kind of prods along that innovation is it government subsidiaries and people that kind of push you in that direction that tax you on carbon credits or whatever like isn't that isn't all of that kind of pushed for a little bit by the government things that the economy wouldn't naturally account for no i think uh the 
the benefit of being able to sell your goods is a market solution. I mean, people want to have clean rivers and lakes and things, and if you can provide uh, a method to do that to cut down on smog, I mean, you li- do live there, you know, like you don't want it either. They don't want to pollute their lungs and so on. Like, then why is there so much have- smog in places in China? Yeah, well, because China doesn't have a free market. They don't have free market solutions because they don't allow a free market. They have an oligarchy, quasi-communist country. So the government in China makes it so that people have the uh, environment be worse off, and then the government in the United States does nothing to help the environment. Well, no, the government in the United States has 50 states with 50 state governments. They want you to live in their state, and they, you know, they all speak a common language. And like, like what happened in Virginia, for example, when they sued DuPont. Uh, because DuPont was depleting Lake Matoka and the Potomac River, and they'd already done so in Ohio and West Virginia, and the Virginians sued them and won, got $108 million from that. Um, and sure, so, but I mean, like, that's a one-off case. It's like, a property I mean, right. Well, through property rights, you know, if people pollute and they are affecting your property, you can sue them. There's court cases and market solutions and environmental regulations. I'm just saying the EPA's environmental regulations, when you let, like, a one one-fits-all kind of thing – uh, if that institution is corrupt, you're fucked. And that institution is corrupt, so get rid of it. I don't think anybody is suggesting that like the EPA will do like a one-size-fits-all for every single state from the top down. I mean, I guess I have a really hard they time can. like looking at how private corporations have acted in the past in terms of dealing with environmental hazards and environmental regulations. I just have a really hard time believing that without some kind of government oversight or instigation that these companies will not try to go like the laziest route possible and maybe pollute some water source that somebody doesn't know about or, you know, fuck with the air somewhere where, you know, there aren't many people to complain. I have a really hard time buying into that, that, that they would do that without any kind of government prodding into a certain direction. They wouldn't, but it, the, the thing is, they have to compete with other corporations that will, and the ones that will are the ones that end up getting hired. I mean, it doesn't matter if you're building a road or a sewage system. If you're cutting corners and causing pollution and stuff, people don't want you to have those contracts. But I, I don't think that's true, because China has shipped us toys with lead paint in them before for our children, but people still go to Walmart to buy toys from China because they're cheaper, even knowing that the manufacturing over there might carry some risks that our manufacturing doesn't. Like, I don't, I don't think that people care as much. Like, you, companies try so what? hard. Like, you look at Chipotle, we'll constantly advertise, like, we're environmentally friendly, we feed our cows, no antibiotics or whatever. But, like, at the end of the day, like, the average person shops so much on price that I don't believe that somebody's going to pay, especially somebody who doesn't have the luxury to do it, is going to pay more, um, is going to pay more for a product that, that might be environmentally friendly. I don't know if the average person cares about it that much. Hmm. Well, it, it does because innovation, like, for example, we use fuel injection instead of carburetors in cars, which drastically reduced the amount of smog and, and has been good for the environment. It's not perfect. It's not like an electric car at that point yet. Sure, but that's but those also there is a, performance gains. What like, you're saying is true is like performance gains and costs and stuff all factor into it. But what I'm saying is the EPA is not, not what stopped the smog in Los Angeles. It was innovations. Like the things that we'd like the EPA to do, it doesn't do. And the innovations aren't perfect either because some people will still pollute if there are other factors of cost benefit where people are going to be like, well, I still want the, I want to roll the dice on lead paint or something. But however, Japan banned all the product, all the uh, food goes and stuff. When they had lead, they stopped buying toys from China just completely for years. And so there was punishment for China. But the U.S. doesn't do that. We don't even tariff them. And there were, I'm sure, some people bought less toys from China or they don't want their kids to have lead paint. But the thing is that there is no utopian model. We're always going to have environmental problems. And we're always going to have people trying to cut corners and dump shit in the river or the ocean or whatever. But the market solutions and innovation have been what's given us results yeah but i still feel like those come from the epa like if you look at to use your car example like who what kind of car manufacturer would ever have like a catalytic converter on a car like all it does is give you more back pressure all it does is it hurts your performance in your car it doesn't help it's another part you have to maintain it's another thing that can go wrong you like there are more sensors it makes the car design more complicated all it does is hurt your vehicle but it's good overall for the environment what kind of market uh, solution is there for a part like this that doesn't help us in any way aside from helping the environment like these things wouldn't exist but without them emissions from cars are much more harmful coming out of the exhaust th- than if those parts weren't there otherwise right yeah, I mean, you can um, you can still have regulations on environment from the state, just not the EPA. And I don't know what a catalytic converter is. I can't really speak to that, but I know fuel injection replaced a carburetor. But it was also it was enhances performance and is good for the environment. And that's the thing that people are going to try and aim at in, innovation-wise. 
uh, because there is a market for that. But otherwise, like you're getting, you're going to have to sacrifice something. So if we're going to do something good for the environment, but it's bad for performance, it's bad for performance. It's better to have something innovative that's good for performance and in the environment, which is what the market pushes for. And I'm not like saying, let's have no regulations and or just let companies regulate themselves. But the market regulations of competition are natural regulations plus state regulations. You have to have state regulations, but uh, you know that's up to them. So they can say, and because that's just for me part of your own sovereignty. Like I don't like a giant federal bureaucratic body playing favoritism because they can say, oh, you can do it this way here and this other way over here. It's just too much room for corruption. But but you don't think there's any room for corruption on a smaller state government that could be much more easily lobbied by a certain corporation for much less money than like the federal government? Like, I don't I don't know if I buy that. Like if I had like, especially it seems like let's say I want to pollute in some place in Washington. Now I don't have to lobby, you know, the, the entire federal government. Now I just have to focus my lobbying efforts on Washington. Like it seems like at that point it would be easier for corruption to be introduced into politics on just the state level. Yeah, I understand what you're saying, but it's act- it's also easier to fight the corruption on a state level because you can point out who's doing the lobbying and doing this, and you got. Uh, well, no, I, no, I, I think that's state. there's no way that's totally wrong because if you can have a multi-state national wide company that has a national wide you know assembly of lawyers ready to do work, and now instead of fighting against them as the federal government of the United States, now the state of Washington has to fight, and then the state of Nebraska has to fight, and all of these individual states would have to bring suits individually against a company that's earning profits all over the country. I feel like that kind of like flies in the face of what we know about like bargaining power to be true that larger groups have an easier time representing themselves against certain entities than you know bunch of disjointed groups right but you have to look at how the group gets selected because the state can uh, choose their own mayors and governors and things and and based on that uh, they have much more power to choose somebody against it whereas if that you know when you get regional scapegoating is when you have growth in size whereas say like new york and california dominate or whatever and they just go we're going to dump all our trash in washington because what you're saying although hypothetical is a real life example because we currently put our nuclear waste on indian reservations that that's a true thing that happens right now they just dump it there because they don't have the voice to say otherwise so we'll just stick up uh, you know barrels of toxic waste on uh, indian reservations and they don't have a, a way out but, I mean, the Indians themselves, if they had a real sovereign state, could say, well, you can't put them here because our state's made it illegal like for you to put this here. But they can't do that but because you... it's not up to their state. It's up to the federal, and they're just like, fuck you. And they have regional scapegoating, whereas where the majority can just gang up and say, we're going to put our trash or put our whatever in this place. There's nothing they can do about it because it's too small a percent versus the whole. I feel like that's giving like a lot of leniency, like looking at only one possible outcome. Like, I mean, on the other possible outcome, you could say that for individual states, it would be very easy to dump it there because you'd have to spend even less money lobbying because you'd have to spend less money funding the campaigns of the people that you would want to be elected. Right. And then these people would make the decisions to harbor some kind of tax for some kind of great benefit. Maybe the argument would be the only reason we can afford to. Um, oh, I can actually use a real life example. Um, casinos are present in the neighboring state to me. There's a state called Iowa and they have casinos. And one of the reasons why the casinos can stay there is because they funnel a lot of money money into road development um, for their interstates, right? And it looks really good for Iowa. It's very easy to sell these um, corporations to Iowa because, hey, look, they give us a fuck ton of money for some of our social products, for roads and whatnot. I feel like it would be the same thing on a state level for, like, say you have the uh, the state of the Minnesuki, whatever tribe, you know, um, and now these guys have politicians. Shoshone. What? Oh. Shoshone. Oh, Shoshone, sure. I, I don't know the name of any of the tribes except for right. Casino Venom. But let's say that you have, um, you know, you've got these politicians and they get all of their funding from a company that employs a lot of people in your state and this company is being paid a lot of money to accept certain waste. Well, how do you fight that as a voter now when everybody in your state is controlled by these lobbyists who don't even have to spend that much money because you're just a little Indian tribe or Native American tribe, I guess I should say, like... Yeah, you're going to have the same problem. It's just worse when you're having some company from another state do it to you or like the federal government that can gang up on you. You have more power to fight internally the company in your state than you do from a federal mandate on something. But if they're getting money from the, if it's a company that's getting money from all over the nation, like, do you think that Flint, Michigan would have experienced the same pressure if it would have been just a Michigan thing? Like those guys had the full brunt of the entire United States public coming down on them in a horrible way and the federal government coming down on them. Like if it was just the city of Flint or just the state of Michigan coming on them, I don't think that the um, coming at them with, with lawsuits or whatever, I don't think that the pressure would be quite the same. Right. No, because, like, that was the problem with Flint. You know, like, the problem with Flint, well, you talk about the water, right? Yeah, yeah, the, the lead in the water. 
I think it was Lud, right? That caused all the kids to get fucked in the head and everything and the over and the fuck ups from the oversight and whatnot, yeah. Yeah, I mean, but we see we have an EPA and it didn't do anything in Flint. But I think if it was up to the state and the consequences were also to the state when you fuck up, like no one's bailing you out, no one's helping you, then they have an incentive not to fuck up. But, you know, when they kept electing these Democratic mayors and things and the town just sold down the river, it's not just, I mean, the housing in Flint is terrible. You can buy a house for a dollar in some places because the property taxes are higher than what the property's worth. Uh, there's so many other problems in poverty that combined to that that led to that water problem in other economic sectors. So that was kind of complicated. Hmm. Okay. Um, I got to go in a few minutes. I'm, I'm totally cool with doing like a part two to this. Cause this is, uh, I think beneficial for people for us to have this conversation. Like, and I understand your points of view, like, yeah, that might be wrong. Maybe, mm-hmm. but I'm just going on historically. It's usually better for state sovereignty on economic issues. And it's the same thing with, um, like gay marriage and marijuana and stuff like that. Like, yes, now it's the law of the land. Like uh, homosexuals can marry. I don't know why it's called gay marriage, become homosexual marriage, whatever. Um, but again, like one thing, I'm pro uh, choice, for example, and that's something I disagree with Trump because he's he's a pro lifer, right? Mm-hmm. But I agree with, again, it's sort of the right thing for the wrong reason. I agree that that ought to be a state decision, the same way with like marijuana, because if you're waiting for the entire federal government to say finally, all right, you can legalize marijuana, which I support, and I don't smoke marijuana, but I just I think it's your body and you have a right, a libertarian point of view. States like Washington and Colorado and, and, and D.C. and other areas have already decriminalized or legalized marijuana. And that's the process, realistically, that actually leads to it being legalized overall because you go and look at Colorado and say, look, it's not the big reefer madness disaster we thought it was going to be, if that's the case. And then other states follow suit. And the same thing before uh, homosexual marriage became law of the land, it had already been legalized in certain states. And that's the way I think even abortion, even though I'm a pro-choice, sir, I think that ought to be a state sovereign decision because if people in a certain area really believe that's murder or whatever, then they have a right to uh, to make that their laws, like, even though I disagree with them. Yeah, but I mean, like, again, like it's not like Europe where we have a bunch of different countries. Like in the United States, um, I don't know, I feel like it's really difficult to have such conflicting federal shit going on between every state. Or like, what if you're married in one state and you want to move to another state? Or you're, or you're visiting a partner and, you know, being gay or whatever, sodomy or whatever, is illegal in one state versus another state. Um, like, I feel like there are so many different complications that are, right, that's why the Interstate Commerce Clause lets, you know, the federal government make rulings on so many of these things. Um, or same thing like with marijuana. Say that you have a medically necessary, um, you know, marijuana prescription in one state and then you've got to move for your job to another state. Like, are you just completely fucked at that point which you are now right if you're in colorado yeah you are now yeah. but the thing is at least you can smoke it and or use it medically in marijuana or in colorado or california but if you left it to the federal government the federal government says marijuana is illegal period and nobody could have marijuana for any reason anywhere sure or the federal government like in the case of gay marriage says you can do it everywhere and fuck the individual yeah, states which agree with that like, which is fine but the thing is what i'm saying is what led to that decision was states already legalizing it and showing that it isn't just such a disaster as predicted is what gave the, them confidence to say look it's working here it's working here we're going to make this law of the land this is the same thing with like phasing out slavery and stuff. It started state by state. The the idea that suddenly just the federal government is going to go and do the right thing just historically doesn't happen. What happens is it goes state by state and puts the pressure on it that way. Well, but I mean, the same process can happen federally, too. Like with prohibition, they tried to outlaw alcohol everywhere. It was massively unpopular. So then they rolled back, you know, prohibition. I mean, I think it can happen if you have to leave anytime soon. I understand we could do this in another. I don't yeah, with prohibition, too. Like states like New York just ignored it. Sure. It's still sold it anyway. So. That yeah, that's what well, can we bring that can we bring that up next because I've got stuff to do. Yeah, sure. And we started late because of the tech yeah. problems and uh, so I disagree with you on a it, ton of things, but I really appreciate the conversation. Well, you sound pretty educated. Ethically, Hillary's laughing about, you know, killing Gaddafi, supported eight hundred thousand children dying from sanctions, so initially supported sanctions on Iran, threatening World War Three with Russia. Her tax plan is atrocious. Like you can argue about Trump's, you know, tariffs and taxes, but she's raising taxes. I mean She's she sucks on every issue, on every issue, and so I, I just cannot uh, I can't vote for her. I think some of the other candidates like Jill Stein are better, but being a pragmatist, she ain't gonna win. So I'm voting against Hillary. Gotcha. All right. Well, well <laughs> I appreciate the conversation, man. Good luck.
been eating his apple for an hour. All right. <laughs> See you later. You got this recorded? Can you send it? Um, yeah, I think I should. Link on Skype or something? Yeah, it should be fine. Okay. All right. Thanks a lot. Thanks. Bye-bye. Bye. Whew. We lads. So, okay. So, in review, I think there's a couple of really, really, really important things. If you're somebody that completely agrees with every single thing that I've ever said, or if you're somebody that disagrees with everything I've ever said, I think there are really important takeaways from that kind of a debate. Um, I think that if you don't, I think that if you're not well educated enough on the issues to dispute something that you believe is wrong, I think that that means that you need to gather more information on the issues. There's a lot of the stuff that this guy said in regards to history concerning the Middle East that I'm pretty sure was incorrect, but he knew way more than me on pretty much everything having to do with specific names, specific companies, specific historical perspectives on, um, on things going on in the Middle East. And that's a problem, right? So if I ever have a debate like that in the future, I need to know way, 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 way more um, about stuff like that. Um, another thing that really hurts is that, um, I, I don't know how to efficiently, when somebody starts to run off with things, I don't know how to rein that in without shouting somebody down. And I know if I would have started to do that, that the autists in chat would have been like screaming, like, oh, like, why are you screaming so much? But like, I guess like, um, like something called, um, a, a gish gallop. What am I thinking of? There was something, I don't, I don't know. There's something like that, but, um, I guess like. Because there were a lot of times early on in the debate where I where I spoke about one thing and then he went on and he Aslan, and then he talked about like twenty five different things, and um, that kind of a that kind of a debate is like a losing. Like there's no way there's no way to come back from that, you know. Um, so I'm not sure if. I'm not sure what the correct thing to do there is to scream them down. Like if they start going off like too much, like, no wait, that's not relevant. Like to just like start, I feel like that doesn't sound good. And I feel like it leads to both sides, like screaming at each other, like Trump does. <laughs> Maybe, I don't know. At the start, he talked for like 10 minutes straight. Yeah, there were definitely times, um, there were definitely times in the beginning where, yeah, it happened with a lot of the Middle East stuff where he like laid out his entire foundation of how Hillary was evil in like 10 minutes straight of talking. Um, you could narrow the focus of the debate. Yeah, I think narrowing the focus of the debate, I think, is intelligent. Actually, I even said that. I said one of the reasons why I didn't like the presidential debates was because I thought that they were way too broad. And I think that having the issues narrowed to literally, like, one topic, like, just foreign policy, just tax policy, just domestic policy, just, like, one thing, morals or ethic policy or whatever, right? When you're talking about things like gay marriage or whatever. Um, I think that something like that would be more conducive so that I know that like, okay, we're going to spend an hour and a half. Like if I knew that we were going to spend like two hours or an hour and a half talking about like just foreign policy, then maybe we can go through and analyze every single thing individually, you know, or maybe just a bit whether the U S could have won the war in Vietnam in four weeks, but decided not to. Yeah. Yeah. Like things like that. But like, but, but then like, you see, like, I don't even remember. I asked a question then and he started bringing up about how we could have won Vietnam in four weeks. And I was like, well, do I want to argue about how we could have won Vietnam in four weeks or about the other stuff or about what my original question was? Like stuff like that is like really, really difficult to, um, you should have asked him for sources in the Middle East stuff. I think he would have had sources. I don't think he was making anything up. I think he would have had sources for most of what he was talking about. Yeah, I also hate that the majority of the conversation was about the Middle East when Hillary's foreign policy is the thing that I like the least about her. Or I'm sorry, actually, the thing that I fucking hate about her. You were driving the conversation to the Middle East over and over again? Well, that's because you kept driving it off into totally other directions. It also seemed like, um, it also seemed like for some of the Middle East stuff, it felt a little bit too weaselly the way that he would describe Hillary and then the way that he would describe, um, like Trump. I didn't like that he presented Hillary as some evil know-it-all wizard. And then said later on that Hillary was too ignorant to understand any of the history. Like, I don't know if I bought... And then he changed that into saying, well, Hillary isn't evil, but she's being controlled by evil people. And then I also didn't like that, um, you know, like, if Hillary becomes president, she's going to be able to continue to do all of these horrible things in the Middle East and start World War III and create a unilateral no-fly zone somehow. Um, but if Trump becomes president, he's not going to be able to do anything because, right, like... I also don't know how to... Um, when I'm having a civil discussion with somebody, I don't know how to tell somebody that they're wrong about something. I have a really hard time. She fucking said that during a debate. Wait, said what? Oh, I'll link the guy's YouTube if you want to go. Regardless of his, um, regardless of his political... If you, if you think, you can't really, if, regardless of whether you think he's got, like, a bad video or whatever on his channel, I mean, I don't think that the guy argued poorly at all. Like, he argued, like, really, really well. When you backed him into a corner, he straight up light. Yeah, I felt like he was, yeah, I don't know. I have like three, so I have three different modes. 
I have three different modes when I'm discussing things with somebody. I have my screaming down chat mode, which is where I see somebody say something retarded in chat. This often involves me strawmanning the fuck out of you, probably banning you immediately, and then just screaming at you and saying shit that's mostly rational, but also probably misrepresenting what you're saying, probably intentionally, because I fucking hate you. And then I have the arguing with a Skype caller mode that I'm already thinking is probably fucking retarded. And in that case, I don't mind being brazen. <clears throat> I'll call them out if they say something retarded or stupid, and I'll be pretty verbose about it. And, um... I think that's my best argumentative mode. But then I have, like... <clears throat> but then I have, like, when I'm trying to do, like, really civil debate mode, I don't know how to say... I don't know how to call somebody... I don't know how to tell somebody that they're wrong or I disagree about something when I'm in, like, really civil debate mode. Like, I did it with Martin a lot. Like, when he talked about, like, drugs for autism. Like, I was 99% sure there is no such thing as a drug for autism. But I let him... I let it slide. I don't know. Oh, then for this guy, like on some of the economic stuff. <laughs>